All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is January 31st, almost the end, end of the month of 2022. The end of the first month is just hours away. <coughs> We're going to have some fun today. We're going to keep digging into the scriptures. We're going we're gonna to recap a little bit about what we spoke about in the last video with, um, with Mike and, uh, and who else? And Anna and Yanni and Brian and a whole bunch of others. There was uh, a couple of uh, new brothers that were in the, in the private Zoom or in the, in the Zoom that we invited everybody to come and join after. There was a couple of new brothers over there, um, which was really exciting because they didn't understand the 14 years in the gospel. So it was it was really fun. We, of course, you know, you get me going on that stuff, man. And I just start going, going, going. And and they were getting it. So it was really exciting. One of the brothers was from New Zealand. Another one uh, spent most of his time in Australia, but uh, is from Michigan and he was in Michigan. So that was very exciting. So you guys know what I'm talking about here. Here's the one with uh, Mike at 165. So. That's the reason. So it'll it'll show two days later on tonight. So we spoke on a bunch of things, and uh, that's why I didn't end up doing a video yesterday or the day before was because uh, having done this live show, I wanted to give a little bit of extra time in between for everybody who wanted to watch that or for everybody who watched that. So you don't have like five hours of video watching in two days, right? As we're as we keep drawing closer, we still like to have those breaks in between, right? There's still life to take place. So uh, with that, that was a lot of fun. So I would recommend going and watch uh, what was talked. We had some fun, you know. I, I love, you know, I do this so often just myself here in my in my little box in my garage. And uh, I just love uh, getting together and, you know, fellowshipping and and a little bit of fun cutting up. Not, not mean stuff, but, you know, just uh, poking around, having fun and uh, just sharing just revelation that is just so mind-blowing and to see others do it like mike and yanni and brian and these guys and and tony as well who is part of that um to see to see these things come about what people pull out and understand and it, it's it all comes from the revelation of who the gospels are speaking to and the 14 years that's what we call the keys to opening the end time books and you come to realize that it's not just the opening of end time books that's the main focus. That's that's what's been going on. That's what's happened here in this ministry for the last four plus years. And uh, but you, we start to realize that it opens up so many other things as well, all the way back to the creation and how long it's been since creation right to the end. It sounds crazy, but we've understood these things now. We see that everything was in threes, right? We've got this video three third thrice. And, and it has to do with you know, the, the first group, the second group, the third group, it has to do with pre, mid, post, all of these things being true, all in speaking to three different groups of people. And those people are the Luke group, the Mark group, and the Matthew group. It's just, it's beautiful. It's jaw dropping. You, you start to, <laughs> you start to see it everywhere and you will never see scriptures the same again. You will understand why Christ said, you know, he came for the for the house of Israel. He came for the lost sheep. And he told the Jews, ah, you're being blinded. You think if you pause and you think and you say, well, wait a second. How fair is that that the Jews have been blinded? They were blinded. Now, in part, because some of them were going to come to see who Christ was. But if the rest were blinded, you think, uh, uh, how are they going to be saved? Remember, they're God's chosen people. So something has to happen. And you see, when you understand these things, when you see these three groups and these, these three portions of time, and it's, it's mind-blowing. It really, really is mind-blowing. And it's easy to, to go into conversations for hours and hours on end, especially with new people, man. I just love it. And I say this as I always do because... If you really want to begin to understand what I'm talking about, when I'm when I'm saying this revelation of who the gospels are speaking to, this what then led us to reveal the 14 years, that it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets, you must come to this playlist. It's called the Revealed End Times Study Notes Series. 
Oh, good, a commercial didn't come up. <clears throat> this intro video right here, 30 minutes long, is the beginning of unlocking the Gospels. You're going to see things that you're just like, what? You'll understand now why, why Luke was told by Jesus that Jesus said, um, or, or that Jesus said in Luke about the story of Jonah, that he would be as Jonah was for 40 days. In Matthew, he said he'll be as Jonah was in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. You realize Christ never actually fulfilled any of those when he was here. He was speaking prophetically. And you'll understand the, the biggest issue, which is the gospel of Mark. When you go to that same story in the gospel of Mark, and this is where there's contention within scripture, because they say, well, that's a contradiction, because in Mark, it says, no sign will be given to you. And he got in the ship and he left. And you think, well, wait a second. That's clearly a contradiction. It's only a contradiction. It only gets explained away in all sorts of different er in, in ways until you reveal or until you come to the understanding of this revelation and you begin to understand who the Gospels are speaking to. I promise you with all that I can promise you of all my, the passion and the revelation, it will be worth every moment of your time. And it'll only be 30 minutes. You see, it's got a printout with it as well. You can come down here into the description box and print it out. And you can also go to ministryrevealed.com. On the homepage on Ministry Revealed, there's these intro videos. And then you can go to the videos in the menu bar and they're all there's like 300 plus videos in there as well. Um, and on the home page, you can also get the ministry revealed book. You can either buy it to have it on paperback, you can either get it as an ebook, or you can download it for free from the website in PDF version. Uh, we've got it in like I think four languages now. And uh, in fact, and if you don't want to download it, you can just read it from the website. You can go to the book page and you can actually just read the whole book right there from the website. And when I say that, you, you're going to want to read the whole book. It's, it's so fascinating. But the first two chapters are like these first two intros, but they give even greater detail. So when you begin to understand who the Gospels are speaking to, and you see that the first shall be last and the last shall be first, as we were told, you know, you realize that in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end is Luke, Mark, Matthew. And you say, well, what does it matter? Well, you'll realize that we've been taught everything in the is. Okay, there's a was, there's an is, which we're still a part of, and then there's the is to come. And the is to come will begin at the time of the escape, which we believe will be this June. And so, and we've spoken about these things. So there's the was, the is, and the is to come. Church has been trying to teach us the is to come from a lens in the is. And they're doing it from the book of the was, being Matthew. They're, they're, and, and so it's all been twisted. And when you do it from a perspective in Matthew, as you'll see in the third video, this perspective from Matthew is what causes all the confusion. Because Matthew's portion of time, Matthew's tribulation is the trumpet seven years. But because the church has taught everything from a Matthew perspective, unbeknownst to them and including everything with a view of Matthew and, and tying things in to, to understand as things in the is, they've done the same thing in the was, and they've missed why the gospel of Mark was actually written. They've missed why the gospel of Luke was written because they don't know who it's directly speaking to. And I promise you, when you understand that, it will, it, everything will change. You will be so excited to seek out scripture, more excited than maybe you are now or than you've ever been in your life. It, it's that good, all right? So these are all the things in here. So what are you seeing? What are you seeing from the, the gospels? You're seeing Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In the end will be Luke, Mark, and Matthew. There's that three again. What does this end up showing you? It ends up showing you that pre, mid, and post are all true. So all these arguments, all these debates, is it pre, is it mid, is it post? I used to bounce around between mid and, and, and pre sometimes because I'd read some and then I'd read another and somebody would show me this and somebody would show me that. And I'd be like, uh, no more. Not when you get the revelation of the gospels, you, really, you realize that all three of them are true. 
and it's fascinating. It is so exciting. Okay, so I promise you guys, anybody that's new, like those two brothers that we met, uh, you're going to want to watch those. You're going to want to go to Ministry Revealed. You can find it right here as well. Just come to where it says website here on the YouTube channel. Go to ministryrevealed.com and you'll find all the links, all the charts, all the graphs. Everything's linked there as well. And, and it's all absolutely free. Okay. If anybody chooses that wants to support, you can go to PayPal or you can go to our GoFundMe and you can support that way as well. And so what we're going to go into today, like I said, we're going to cover some of these things. Uh, we're going to touch on some of those things that Yanni and I had talked about, that Yanni had shared, and we kind of we built on it more and more, um, which relates to the number 18, which relates to the stone's throw and the and the roiling of water. I I loved it. It was so exciting because it showed something that for one, I had never yet seen, so it's I hadn't taught it until on uh, the live show, and that was what a what a specific word means with look up and how many times it's used. So we're going to touch on that today as well. We're going to develop that, and then we're going to go and uh, talk about the white horse rider. So we're going to talk about this time of this stone's throw, and it's going to lead us right into the white horse rider, and you're going to say, We've already spoken about the white horse rider before. You know, we've already talked about the stone's throw. Well, I'm going to add more details to this um, than we've ever yet, uh, than we've ever understood before. And the reason it makes such a difference is because of words that are used. You know, sometimes it, it leaves you scratching your head. Well, when we get to that part about what we're going to add to the white horse rider, not changing what's been revealed about the white horse rider, but adding more information about the white horse rider, I believe we're going to be able to prove even more so once and for all that indeed the white horse rider is the timing we've been saying it is a part of and the book it's speaking from. Okay? Most of you guys know what I'm talking about when I say that, but what you haven't understood is the other portion of this wording that we're going to get into. And why would it say it twice? <laughs> I love it. Okay? You're going to see why I believe why it says it twice, and I believe I can even prove it. So we're going to go into that. And that came about from a, a brother who had asked a, a question. And I can, I'm sorry, but I can't remember his name. Um, but he had asked a question about this person's name and where it was found. And I thought, huh. And so I started looking into it more, and and so that's what I'm going to share in the in the towards the end. Um, another thing I want to share. So before we get into that 18, and then into the white horse, uh, um, before we get into this stone's throw detailed information, and then go further into the white horse, I want to share a couple of other things because there was a, a couple of fun things that were shared in the live show. I'm gonna I wanted to bring one of them up, and another thing was. I had two questions just recently asked. One was posted uh, in a question in the last video. And I shouldn't even say a question. Sometimes people say, oh, in fact, you know what? I think we might have even spoken about it in the live show uh, just briefly as well. And I, there's been so much going on now lately with videos and, and doing the live show and now this that I was trying to remember, you know, did we do it in the private or did we do it in the live show? that I fully talk about in the last video. So I'm, I'm like, where do we talk about it? But um, we know it very well. And it's that question of, are we not the temple? And people would say, see, we're the temple. There is no third temple, physical temple coming. Well, it's no different than these things we've been talking about, that things repeat themselves. There is a seven for Mark and there is a seven for Matthew. We are the temple, but there's also a temple coming. Okay, we're going to be able to confirm that. And that, I'm just going to touch on it quickly. We know it, but I want to show people that have posted or, or wondered about it and said, well, there is no third temple coming. So they would debate the Jews and other Christians saying, you're not getting a third temple. You guys just don't realize we are the temple. And they'll say, so we are the temple. There's no third temple. But it's because you, it, there's no understanding of who the Gospels are speaking to. If you understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you'll realize that there's still an end of days portion for the church who is still the temple. You see? And when that portion of seals is over, 
then there will be an actual third temple. All right. But people will debate and they'll want to they'll want to say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. But it's because it's simply because they haven't yet had the revelation in this playlist or in the book to be able to understand who the Gospels are speaking to. That's why I say it's so vitally important to start with the understanding of the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. All right. And then another question as we as we continue through this is um, where do people go when they die? OK, we see that, uh, you know, Daniel said was told to wait until the end. You know, but Paul said, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he says, so what's going on? We'll touch on that as well. All right. So let's get started here. Let me show you this. This was a, a fun one that was shared. Uh, oh, actually, it was shared by Ed. We might have talked about it. I think we spoke about it in the live show as well. Actually, I'm sure we, we have. But Ed shared this with us uh, in the forum. And for those who are wondering about when I say the forum, when you hear me talking about the forum, when you go to the website, if you go to the menu bar, you can see, you'll see this link that says forum. It takes a few seconds to sign up. Uh, again, it's free as well. And there's over 900 of us in there. And most people watch, you know, just see what's going on. And, you know, we share things in there. We uh, uh, prayers and, and scripture and questions and news and the stuff going on around the world and all these things going on. So there's a lot of really good stuff shared in there. And it's with like minded brothers and sisters. All right. So if you want a place to be with like-minded brothers and sisters looking for the coming of the Lord and, and drawing diligently closer to him to understand him and get to know him better and better, come and join us. All right. So this was shared in there by Ed. And I want to share this uh, just as another little, you know, another little, man, there it is again, piece of comfort. And what it is, if you guys remember, we've been sharing now that the beginning, the, the end of the Feast of Weeks, we have shown and shown and shown, and I know some people still aren't fully getting it. I can understand why it appears to be confusing, but I, it's not once you see it. it. It goes back to who the Gospels are speaking to. And so if, let me bring up the, my favorite book, my favorite e-sword, you see, so anybody who doesn't have eSword, by the way, it's called e-sword. It's a free program, depending maybe if you have Apple, it's a few bucks a year. But this program is called eSword, and you get the KJV Plus, and look at what you get. You get all the word definitions. See all of these definitions of words. It will it will help you to understand ten times, a hundred times better than you have understood things in your life with Scripture. When you read the word woman, you don't know if it's speaking about an adulteress, about a wife, uh, 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 about, you know, there's so many. I think there's five versions of what woman means. So having a program like this is is so valuable. I believe it's one of the mysteries that had to be revealed so that people can have such easy access to the Strong's Concordance, right? The Septuagint, stuff like that. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Concordance, I mean. So... With that, this is what we're saying. So Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Everybody knows their discourse is very different, right? So if the discourses are different, there's got to be something else at play. And when, when you begin to understand that, and you go to Leviticus, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this. When you go to Leviticus, and we see that the bride isn't this first fruits, this one. This is the first fruits, which is Christ. Okay. Christ was in the beginning. The word in the beginning is 7225, at the beginning of the whole Bible. Christ was the first fruits of this harvest. And remember what happened. So what is it at that time? It's barley. And so people get confused and sometimes believe that, that the bride is the barley harvest, like, you know, that, that wheat barley connection, but they're not. You see, Christ was the first fruits. And remember what happened at, uh, at his, at his uh, crucifixion and resurrection? People came out of the grave. Okay, that's in the is. From, from Christ until the time of the escape, we are living in the middle portion, which is called the is. And we're at the very tail end of it. But we're living in the is. And at Christ's resurrection, there were those that rose out of the grave. They were 
the the main harvest, if you will, of the fruit of the first uh, uh, sorry of the barley harvest. He was the first fruits. They were the main harvest. And then you've got the corners and gleaning, which are those left after. Well, when you come to the wheat, the first fruits being spoken of here, that is with leaven unto the Lord, isn't the same first fruits. It's the first fruits 1061. This first fruits has to do with the bride of Christ. The bride is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Okay? And the first fruits of the wheat harvest, you have seven Sabbaths, and then you number 50 days. And this is something that we've been talking about for a while lately. When you number seven Sabbaths, and you begin from after the unleavened bread, and you number the true seven Sabbaths, June 14th, 2022, is the seventh Sabbath. And so from the morrow after, which is the 15th, you number 50 days. What do we know about Luke? Luke's portion of time is when the seven times seven is over, it's the 50 days that come before the 14 years of tribulation then start. Because the code of the end of days is 50 days, 14 years, and then the 50th jubilee. So what do you have? You have seven times seven, then 50. So you got seven times seven with days and a 50 with days. And then you've got seven and seven, which is years, ending with the 50th year. So it's a fractal, one of the other. One is the small one, one is the big one. <coughs> and what you come to find out in what we've been sharing is that we know Luke's group is what? It's seven days. And then the eighth day is the beginning of the 40 days of what we've shown is the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. This is Luke's discourse. Luke's discourse relates to that 50 more so 40 day portion of time before the 50th day, which is when the Holy Ghost comes at why they were saying new wine. You see, this isn't new wine. You see, the, the Feast of Weeks being only numbering 50 days isn't new wine. New wine comes all the way over here. That's why they were accused of being drunk with new wine in Acts chapter 2. So what we're seeing here is this is where Luke's count begins. This is where Luke's discourse is. This would be what we're looking at for the escape of the bride of Christ and the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. So what do we have? June 22nd, 622. We know from Luke 21, we'll, we'll touch on this as well. We know when we get to the stone's throw, we know from Luke 21 that there's going to be this sighting of a stone's throw that's coming first, shortly before the bride is taken. We'll see it. And we saw this is where the, when we talk about it later, when we talk about this look up, and when you see where the word, the term look up is found in scripture, it is 100% what we've been sharing as to where it should be found and when it should come. And this, a lot of this talk lately, now we've been talking about this stone's throw for about cl probably close to three years because we know it's coming first. We know it's going to be the Lord who's the only one who could throw it. But then recently we've had, everybody knows of that movie that came out, Don't Look Up, which is a complete opposite of, of the actual term look up. And the stone's throw from that movie equaled June 19th. So the timing is just, it's unbelievable. And we've been talking about it lately. But what else is connected to this? Well, June is the sixth month and it's the 22nd day, which we believe is the escape of the bride of Christ from the evening to evening, the escape of the bride of Christ and then the beginning of the for, son of the, the 40 days of the Son of Man. Well, one thing we've been teaching about as well that we've been trying to discern for a long time is our brother Enoch. Our brother Enoch. Okay, Enoch walked with God. Okay, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. We've been talking in this ministry for two to three years about understanding that 
Enoch's 365 years are a typology for us to understand in the end of days that it is 365 days. So from the time of Enoch's birth, if you took 365 days, it would be like him dying on the day of him being taken, you see, him uh, of his birth. So 365, so he was born at this time, 365 later, bang, this is his death. And what are we looking for? Sorry, not his death, when he was taken, right? Because Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And this is exactly who we're trying to be, just like in, in Hebrews chapter 11. It's going to have to relate to, to wherever the Lord God is counting from to equal this time of 365. And it would be for those who, were dil- who have faith, first of all, to believe that he is God, who are diligently seeking him to be translated, right? And will be translated. So when we look at what we were showing here with Enoch, we see that Enoch, of course, lived 365 years. Uh, Then he was taken, right, by God. But look at when Enoch was born. So Ed had found this. Enoch was born in year 622. And this year, the count equaled 622. 622. And where's the year's end? Right here. The year's end has to do with the solar. You see why this is so fascinating? All of these things that are equaling this time, 622, 365 days, Enoch born in the year 622. And if you take 365 years as days, that would mean at the time of his birth, 365 later would be the time of him being taken. We have been looking for the year's end, brothers and sisters, for three years here in this ministry. And now we've got it. So now when we looked at this at this Leviticus thing, and then we come into Deuteronomy, and we went into Deuteronomy 34, 22, that we've been talking about for so long here as well, it says, and thou shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits. Look at that. It's the same first fruits. Thou shall observe the feast of weeks. Okay, that's the feast of weeks, just like it said in Leviticus. Of the first fruits, the same one. Of the wheat harvest, that's the bride. Comma and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Remember, the year's end was the solar course of the sun. When's the solar, when's the course of the sun? Right here. And John said what? John needed to decrease. So this is the peak of John, and then it decreases. And six months later, John to Jesus, they were born six months apart. And John told us that he must decrease so that Christ can increase. And six months later would be the time that Christ would be born, because that's when the sun is at its lowest. And at that solstice, then it starts to increase. Everything is telling us this is the time. And to add to the excitement of it that we shared recently, we saw that uh, that thou shalt uh, uh, observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. And look at the feast of ingathering. The feast of ingathering is related to the feast of weeks. And look at the number, 614. Where's the feast of weeks? Right here, the 15th of Savan, the seven times seven, eight, the seven Sabbaths. This is the seventh Sabbath. And what is it? 614. So again, now you got 614. We got Enoch 622. We got the year's end and decreasing to increase. And so what do we have? The ingathering, which is related to the Feast of Weeks. And it's the actual Hebrew word that means that's for 614. And it comes from the Hebrew word. We shared this recently. And it comes from the Hebrew word. 622. <laughs> I still love this one. I, I'm sure it excites you guys as well. And it means to gather for any purpose, hence to receive, take away, that is remove, reward, re-reward. It's it's awesome. And here it is again. What? June 6, right? 22, which is the day we've been saying this is the 
Feast of Weeks. And then from the 15th, there's day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then what? The Lord begins the 40 days of the Son of Man. The escape of the bride happens. And it's the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. It's 622. This is what's going to lead us. So this is something for you guys to remember that when we go into this conversation about the, the stone's throw, when we go into the conversation about the white horse rider in the Gospels, all of it is connected to this time right here. The counts are just, they're mind-blowing. And we have to understand, the first covenant the Lord ever made was the Feast of Weeks. Right? It was the rainbow. It was the bow. We talked about that with the white horse rider recently. Right? He comes with a bow. And people say, well, no, it means the simplest fabric. Yes, I understand that definition. But we've got no other definition to go from. And they say tuxon, so they say toxin. So they're thinking it's the jab and all these. No. Maybe it's a typology, but it's not the end of days white horse rider. He comes with a bow, no arrows. When was the first covenant made? with with uh, uh, Noah and his family with a rainbow. And that bow, even though we know it's a rainbow, the definition of that bow is the same definition for a bow and arrow. So he's coming with a bow. What was it back then? With a bow. Okay? He's coming with a crown that was given to him. We know that at the time of the espousals, a crown was given to him. By his mother. That's from a, a Song of Solomon, chapter 3. And what do we see? A crown, it says, in the white horse rider was given to him. Because it's the time of the espousals. The time that's going to connect to the apostles. Which we're going to talk about when we get to this, to this later portion. It's so fascinating. It's all connected, guys. It's all connected. Sorry, give me one sec. So keep uh, keep these things in mind and just I wanted to share it because I did not know that Enoch's birth was in the year 622. I mean, come on. <laughs> do do here's the thing. I don't want people to say, "Oh, I'm hanging my hat because he was born in the year 622, so that must mean it's got to be 622 when we go." No. We had already understood these things from scripture. And then more is being found that's confirming the exact same time. You see, like whether it was those movies we spoke about in the last video or two. It has nothing to do with these movies or these shows. I don't care. We have understood these things revealed to us from Scripture. And these shows and these movies and these things in life and finding out these things reveal, or I should say not reveal, but confirm these things that we've already understood from Scripture. That's why it's so fascinating. That's why that, that stone's throw of that movie, which is Don't Look Up, and it's about a meteor coming, that's why it's so fascinating. Because it falls smack dab to the day. What? To the day that we've been showing from Scripture is where the account of it would take place? This is why we take notice of these things, right? It's so exciting. It's so awesome. Now, let me go to the next thing. And that is people um, asking or, or commenting and saying, well, there is no, there's not going to be any third temple. Okay? We are the temple. Well, you are correct. We are the temple. But there is also going to be a third temple. And when you understand that, let's go to Mark's discourse. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I'm going to show you guys the video to watch. But when you see this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, standing where it ought not. Look at that. Standing where it ought not. Now, why would this be? different wording in Mark than it is in Matthew. So this one says standing where it ought not. But in Matthew's discourse, the one everybody knows so well, 
it says, stand in the holy place. So one says standing where it ought not, and the other one says it's standing in the holy place. That's not the same thing. And what you come to realize is if you go to the gospel, I mean, if you go to the book of Daniel, you're going to find out that Daniel has two abomination of desolations being spoken of. What? That's right. There's one in Daniel chapter 11, which is the one that relates to Mark. And there's one in Daniel chapter 12, which is the one speaking to Matthew. And what you understand, what you'll come to understand, and when you watch the video that I'm going to share, that I'm going to point you to, you're going to understand that this standing where it ought not, which also means placed where it shouldn't be placed. Okay, look at the word standing. It's the same one as stand on the other one. But it also means, you can compare it to 5087, to place. So something being placed where it should not be. Well, if Mark, as we've shown, is written to the sleeping church, is written to the house of Israel, which, which references the world, then, yes, we are still in the Gentile age during the time of seals. The seven years of seals is still the Gentile age. It'll be the time of the Antichrist and the false prophet at the midpoint in particular, or midish, as we've shown it about two and a half years in. And so what happens? The mark of the beast. So the mark of the beast is being placed where it shouldn't be. Because why? Because we are the temple of God. Now, anybody that's listening, prayerfully, none of us will be here and we'll already be gone to the third heaven, being part of the bridegroom, having escaped all these things. Okay. Those who were watching and praying to be accounted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay. This is the time of the mark of the beast in the temple, which is the body that we currently possess. So those who are alive during the time of seals. Okay, so when people say, well, no, we are the body. Well, they're correct. It's absolutely true. But when Mark's portion of time, when the age of the Gentiles comes to an end at the end of seals, it'll be the seven years for Matthew. And in the seven years for Matthew, the temple is going to get rebuilt during the first three and a half years. Just like we shared in the last video, when it's said in Zechariah chapter six, and then you get to Zechariah chapter eight, which is the beginning of trumpets. And it's talking about the Lord there being on Mount Zion and let their hands be strong because they're starting to rebuild. You see, what's going to happen is by mid trumpets, Satan is going to be cast down. That ties into our 18, by the way, right? We'll talk about that when we get there. But we know this is the three and a half years of trumpets when Messiah is now cut off and Satan has been, and it's because Satan has been cast down. And so what will, what will have been built? The physical temple, the physical temple. So now what's going to happen now, Satan, not the antichrist. Now it's, it was, it was the antichrist and then the false prophet and the antichrist at the end of seals, antichrist is killed. All the other Kings have their dominions taken away and they're wounded, right? Christ is there. He makes peace with the nations. They're rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple while chaos is still reigning from, from the trumpets. And then what happens? Mid-trumpets, Satan is now cast down. The pit is open. The Antichrist is brought back. And all three of them are there. And what happens? Satan goes into the holy place, which is the temple. It's the rebuilt temple. Declares himself God. You see, they are both true. And the reason for confusion, as I said in the beginning, brothers and sisters, it always 100, oh, pretty much 100% of the time goes back to that playlist, the very first thing that the Lord revealed to me, which was, and when I say revealed to me, I just meant led me through reading a scripture. And in one moment, I said, wait a second. And if you go back to watch one of my very first videos, I think maybe five, six videos in or something like that. There's a moment on uh, D on September 8th, 2017, where that began. In the middle of the video, I'm saying, wait a second, something caught my attention. And I say, well, if any, if I, anything comes from it, I'll let you guys know. 
that was the beginning of everything. And what came from that started with the revelation of who the Gospels were speaking to. And everything has changed since. Everything has begun to open book after book after book. That's why I say how important it is, not just for me, for all of us. Anybody seeking to understand and draw closer in understanding to the Lord. You want to see another way we can prove this? Check how awesome this is. Okay, well, first of all, let me show you this. This video right here. So this video, jaw-dropping August and beyond, because we thought it was the time frame, right? This video, you'll see the picture of, you know, the the which was the modern uh, built temple. And then you see the Moses temple that was built, all right, that he built. And so if you come and watch this video, the uh, the main focus I want you to take from this is the two temples. You're going to understand as you've never seen it before. Uh, another place is when you go into the playlist here, you can go to the 12th video. And at the last video, after you've after you've understood those beginning ones, you go to the 12th video and it's the it's the three discourses all broken down for the end of days. That 40, 50 days we were showing here at the beginning, then the seven years of seals and the seven years of trumpets. It is the revelation of the discourses. And you're going to see just what I was talking about here with uh, Matthew and Mark and the differences of the two temples and who with Antichrist and false prophet and then false prophet being killed, but uh, uh, sorry, but Antichrist being killed and false prophet still here. And then Satan cast down, the pit is open, all three of them are there. I mean, that's, that's why when you get to uh, Revelation chapter 16 and it says, and I saw a spirit, unclean spirit like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. If they're the same, how come all three of them are there with spirits coming out of them? You see? It's because there are three. Just like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just like pre, mid, and post. Guys, it's always three. It's always three. Well, now let me show you the difference between Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel. See this? Okay, this is the, these are the temples. Whose temple is this? This is Moses' temple. Whose temple is this? This is the, the one for the Jews, right? With Solomon. So what do you have here? You have a house of God, right? The temple of God, which is covered with what? It's covered with skins. So you have the exact typology of the house of God covered in I'm pinching it right now, covered in flesh. You see? Covered in skin. That's the age we're in. We are that temple covered with flesh that he dwells within. But when this age of the Gentiles, when this age ends and the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion, they're going to rebuild this one. This physical one will be rebuilt in Jerusalem because it'll be part of the millennial reign. You see, one with skin, one with stone. They're still both a part of the end. We are in this one right now. And when tribulation of seals ends, this one will end and it will begin this one because he will be here on Mount Zion overseeing the rebuilding. Just like Zechariah 6 and Zechariah uh, 8 goes on to tell us, okay? It's so exciting, guys. When you understand these things, you watch these videos and you begin to understand this stuff, it's just, <laughs> all these things begin to open like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of revelations have come to us now that have all tied in together perfectly. Now, let's get into the next piece. The next piece I wanted to share with you guys was uh, a question that was recently posted by a new brother in uh, the forum about where somebody goes when they die. And I thought it was a good question. You know, it's not one that gets asked very often, but it's a very good question because a lot of people tend to just, we tend to assume where we go, right? That everybody goes to heaven. If you believe in Jesus, everybody goes to heaven. If you don't believe in Jesus, everybody goes to hell. Well, there's more to it than that. <laughs> You must remember this, guys. It is in everything. Luke, Mark, Matthew. When I, when I say the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to and why 
I was led to the revelation of those of the Gospels first was because it was the foundation for absolutely everything else that would come. All the way back to in the beginning. To understand the three groups of that creation within creation. To the difference of times that we're in now. From days to thousands, from thousands of days, and the, the gap at the beginning. It all came by starting to understand, first and foremost, who the Gospels were speaking to, and to understand that the end time order was that Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end would be Luke, Mark, and Matthew. It's awesome. All right? And so this is the same type of thing that comes about because what our brother was asking was, where do we all go? Where do, where do people go when they die? And the reason for the question, was, like I said, it was it's a very good question because you see, here's that abomination spoken of by Daniel. That's the that's the Matthew one. So, what do you end up seeing here? It says at the it ends the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter twelve verse thirteen. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest. Was he is he is he sleeping? Well, we know he's passed, right? He's he's dead. But those in the Lord, those even with the Father, they're not dead. We know they're resting, we could say, right? It says, uh, uh, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. So if you read this, you would say, well, it would seem like everybody is, is just lying in their grave. They're maybe having a, a real long sleep and experiencing things, you know, in the spiritual realm as they're there. But of course, when you're in that state, man, a thousand years feels like a day. It's it's not a big deal, right? So this is what's going on for Daniel right now. And so when people read things like this, you would say, well, the, the first thought is, well, we must all be like Daniel then. I mean, when everybody dies, wouldn't they all just have the same thing? I mean, Daniel loved the Lord. Daniel believed the Lord, a prophet of the Lord. So if he's lying in his plot and waiting till the end, then are we all going to be lying in our plot waiting for the end of days and then everybody being raised again. No, it's not the case for everybody. Because just as I had mentioned that you have Luke, Mark, and Matthew, that everything is in threes, it's no different than this. Okay? Now, what else do we have? Within Luke, Mark, and Matthew, well, there's still unbelievers in all three groups. There are still those who died and, and all those people that are in hell. Yeah, everybody who didn't come to believe is in hell. Okay? There's, there's no way around that. But the three places where believers go, they're not all the same. Everything's in threes. The same thing applies. It's threes. It's, it's, the, it's that what we said before, that, that mystery with uh, the whole thing with Tesla. Right? This whole three, six, nine. Right? If you knew the magnificence of three, six, and nine, then you would have a key to the universe. Well, what's three, third, thrice that we shared in that video about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Holy Spirit, Son, Father? You have three. Three and three is six. Three and six is nine. So three, three, three is three, six, and nine. And what else? Three, six, and nine is what? Eighteen. We're going to talk about 18 when we get there as well, you see? But you have that 18 showing up. And there's another thing with 18. Oh, we'll, we'll get there when we when we get there, uh, which we know we can say, you know, 18 is what? Six, six, and six. And what happens in 18? So six, 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 I might as well say it now. Six, six, six is 18 as well. So first of all, it's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then the three, three, three for all three portions of groups and all three portions of time with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is the three, 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 the three, six, nine. Okay, it's a key to the universe. But all three of them together equal 18. And 18 is also 666. And at 666, which equals 18, guess what? Satan is cast down. The pit is open. Messiah is cut off. See? Everything. And the enemy copies it. He takes that same 18, but he does it in 666. It's so, it's, it's, it's crazy. 
It's so wild to think about, guys, and to understand these things and to put these things together. So here we had Daniel lying in his plot. Okay? What if we go to Luke chapter 16? We'll see the other group in Luke chapter 16. Check this out. Uh, where are you? Where are you? Right here. Okay? The story of the rich man. Okay, listen to this. Starting in, uh, in Luke 16, verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So wherever this angel carried him is also where Abraham is. And Abraham, of course, would be connected to the same place where Daniel should be. Wouldn't, wouldn't that make sense? Because they're part of the same time, same belief in the same Lord. So uh, into Abraham's bosom, uh, the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, uh, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Look at this lift off or this lift up. It's not the same one. See this? This is why when we get to this other part, when we're going to talk about this lift up and look up, it's not even the same word as this one. This one's used 19. The other one is used four times. This is why I say the power of having a program like eSword unlocks, unlocks, unlocks all sorts of beauty within Scripture and revelation of the Lord. Okay? So what are we seeing? We're seeing the one who's in hell, and we're seeing where Abraham and Lazarus are, and probably Daniel. Where are they? Is he seeing them in heaven? No. He's seeing them somewhere. You know, these guys are in, the, the, the rich man here is the one in hell. We see that what? There's a great gulf, right? There's a, there's a big gaping chasm vacancy, a big empty place between the two of them. I don't know if you guys ever heard, but, but Jews, let me see if I can find it. Is that what Jews say? Like, um, uh, um, it's many Jews you'll hear say that they don't believe in heaven. Okay. Well, in the context that we're talking about, they don't believe in going to heaven like we do. Now, there's a difference within Judaism and compared to what the Jews might say and so on and so forth. But you probably have heard that from Jews. You'll see interviews with Christians and, and Jews talking and they don't believe in heaven. Well, here's the thing. Jews that don't believe in going to heaven. Well, that's because they don't go to the heaven as we think as Christians. We just showed right here that Abraham... And this Lazarus, this beggar, and Daniel are all in a place that, that's this holding area. You see, we've been told, I think, oh man, I remember with Catholicism years ago, I was just little, but that they, they would call it purgatory, right? There's, the, there's this holding place. That has nothing to do with us. It would appear there's this holding place whatever you want to call it, lying in your plot, Daniel, until the time of the end, that Daniel, Lazarus, Abraham would all appear to be a part of that place. But the, the rich man that died is in hell. So there's hell and there's this place where these guys are. Now, why are these guys in this place and they're not in the third heaven or they're not in paradise? Because it wasn't their promise. What was the promise to Abraham and to, and to all his descent that, that they would inherit the land? That, that it would be a place of heaven on earth. That they would dwell in peace and it was their promise that they would rule and reign for a thousand years. This was their promise. This is why when you read from the gospel, <coughs> it's why when you read uh, from the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke, you hear the conversation about the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is the third heaven and paradise. They're both a portion of the, of the kingdom of God. But what are Jews looking for? The kingdom of heaven. 
That's why when you read about it in Matthew, it's about the kingdom of heaven. Let me show you these differences. I think we'll see it right here, if I remember correctly. Uh, in Mark's story of the trans or Luke's story of the transfiguration, you see, we know that the bride is going where? This is the pre-trib typology of the escape of the bride within the story of the transfiguration when the Lord comes about in eight days, like we were showing on June 22nd, about in eight days, after those seven days from the beginning of the 50. And what happens? You see, but I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Bam. That's the look up for your redemption draweth nigh. That's the escape going to the kingdom of God. We know that the that the Luke group, the bride of Christ, the sons of God, they are going to the third heaven. When we go to Mark's version, before the transfiguration, it says, Verily, verily I say unto thee, unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come. Well, now this is the past tense, having seen it come. Having seen what come? The kingdom of God. What else is the portion of the kingdom of God? It is paradise. It's paradise. Okay? That's the difference. It's paradise. And look at when it is. After six days as after six years of seals. We've shared on this many times. Now let's see what Matthew says. Chapter 17. It might be 16 actually. The last verse of 16. And it says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Where's, how come it doesn't say the kingdom of God? Now they're going to see him coming in his kingdom. This is the Lord coming feet down on the Mount of Olives, and what's going to happen? If you go read in other parts of Matthew, you're going to see it is the kingdom of heaven. It is the promised heaven on earth. When the 14 years of tribulation is over, the end of Matthew's seven years is over. The trumpets are over. What's going to happen? All those who were laying in their plot shall be resurrected and rewarded. You see, let's let's go, for example, let me show you here in uh, Revelation 11. At the seventh trumpet, okay? There's the seventh trumpet. The Lord has come. He's, he's reigning now forever and ever. We come down to verse 18, and it says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that, that, uh, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward. This isn't the escape bride of Christ reward. This is the reward to thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints and to them that fear thy name, both small and great, and thou should, uh, uh, um, and shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. So what reward is this? It's the reward to the prophet. Well, who was a prophet? Daniel. See? And to the saints. What? Those who put their necks on the line for the Lord? Who never took the mark of the beast. They'll be resurrected to dwell with the Lord. They're going to be resurrected for the millennial reign. This is their reward. You see, <clears throat> so let's go to Romans. Let me make sure. I think Romans 11. Romans 11. Watch this. This is such a, an awesome. Romans is so exciting, guys. See, after the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, let's go down a little bit further. Listen to this. this. This has to do with what we were talking about earlier with being blind as well. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which it seeketh for, but the election has obtained it, and the rest were blinded? According it, as it is written, God hath given them a spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. Listen to this. Unto this day. That means right now, too. What? If, if this was meant to be you, and you came to read this, wouldn't you be upset? You have Christians telling you, you have to come to believe in the Lord, and your spirit just won't recognize it. You, you can't see it. You've been blinded. 
You'd say, well, uh, then how is that fair to me? How is that going to be fair to all the Jews? It's not fair, is it? That's because this portion of time still isn't for them. For some of them, yes. There is a purpose for some of them that come. But the majority still will not. Because their portion is trumpets and the promised millennial reign. See, listen to what it says. And David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap. This is because of their fall. So we're so grateful and we're to uplift and to give thanks to the Jews for their fall. Because their fall allowed us to be grafted in. Amen and hallelujah. That's why we, that's why we lift them up and we give them thanks. But we cannot forget. We are living in their portion of groups, right? We are living in their portion of thousands of years. From God's creation with Adam. So we're to uplift them. We're to give them. Uh, we're to, to, to pray for them. And when the time of the Gentiles comes to an end, which is the end of seals, they will then see and their promise is coming. Watch this. Um, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. But, Remember, there's a reward coming for these guys. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, this is a dual thing, right? It it brought riches to, to them because they've been given power over the world during this time of their of their of their of their falling right so they've been given the riches of the world that's why the jews are in control of so much but it also means that now if their fall be the riches of the world meaning the world which is the house of israel which is all the gentiles grafted in and so forth it's christ being the riches that we get to take part of first during their fall Okay, so it's got a dual meaning here. And the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So what's this saying? How much more is the fullness of the Gentiles going to be awesome than the one for the, than the one for, sorry. How much more will awesome will the, the fullness of the Jews be when it's over compared to the one for the Gentiles? You see, the one that we're going to be a part of, that we pray to be accounted worthy to escape all these things and go to the third heaven is going to be magnificent. The the rapture of the great multitude going to paradise is going to be magnificent. But this says, you think it was awesome for what I'm giving to the Gentiles? Don't forget that the Jews are my people. They are the one that I chose and they had to endure all these things and and their stupidity and their fall and everything. But they remembered me the whole way through. They didn't always understand because I blinded them as well. And what ends up happening? Their reward at the end is going to be even more awesome. Listen to what it says. For I speak unto you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them, right? Because it was in part blinded. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, who's the world? The house of Israel. Okay? This is why Christ came for the world. He came for the the world that he created in the days and that group that he created in the days. For if uh, uh, if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, What shall the receiving of them be, here it is, but life from the dead? What's going to happen? What was was Daniel told? Daniel was told, stay, you're going to lie in your plot, right? 
you'll probably be with your, your spirit, your soul. You're going to be in this place, in this vast area where Abraham and everybody is. To us, to us thinking in time, we think, man, that's a long time to be there. But not really. Not when you're not in the, in the, in the realm of time that we're stuck in. It feels like hours, maybe a, few, a couple days or so. You see, Abraham was, died a lot longer. And when that rich man died and Lazarus died, Lazarus was in Abraham's arms. You see, so he, they're there in this waiting place. But that's not where the bride goes. That's not where the Gentiles go, right? The house of Israel in there. It's different. You see, so now we can see who are those that will be raised from the dead. It's going to be those who were given the promise of the millennial reign. And of course, those who would put their lives on the line, the saints. Remember it said the prophets and the saints? The saints are also going to be resurrected. They're the ones who put their necks on the line. Who never took the mark of the beast and, and were beheaded for it during the time of tribulation. This is their reward. Rising from the dead. Whoa. That's a lot wilder looking than people vanishing. Oh, I'll take the vanishing any day. <laughs> right? Let's all take the vanishing. But these guys, I mean, whoo, they're going to come up from the ground. This is their reward. So to, to answer part of that question so far is to say, this isn't for us. We're not going to be those lying in their plot until the end of days, until the end of the end of days. This is for those who were promised their millennial reign, their peace on earth, their ruling and reigning as God's chosen people from the start. That's for them. You see, another place to find the answer to this <coughs> or to see that it's three, is where the whole revelation of the 14 years began. Now we can do it from the beginning of Genesis, but this is where the question first began being asked. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Okay, the in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. And what do we see? Such and one. Okay, like. Like a rapture. So whoever this was, we know it's Paul in the, in, the, in the scenario of what happened. But what's he telling us? He's telling us the first group before the 14 years starts. This is the end time understanding of it. In a period of time that's above 14 years, had to be less than 15 or they would have said above 15. So a period of time above 14 years, which we know is that 50 days and within that time frame of the 50 days, which we believe is the seventh to the eighth day after. We have one that is caught up. This is the pre-trib escape, and they go to the third heaven. It's not the rapture, though. It's like a rapture. And then you have, so this one is in Christ, okay? No mistaking, this one, this group here is in Christ. These are the co-heirs, the sons of God, the bride of Christ, okay? This one says, I knew such a man. <clears throat> what does this mean? Like. So not the same type as this one that was in Christ, but I knew such a man. And this was something Yanni brought up in the, in the live show as well. This such a man means it's not the same type of man. Well, we know that the second group creation, the one in the days on the sixth day, was the creature. Right? It relates to the creature. It was the world creation that the Lord had made. So it's not the ones in Christ, but similar, and it's the second group. It's the Mark group. And this group wasn't like a rapture. It says it was the rapture. And where does this group go? go? They go to paradise. So we can clearly see right off the bat, there are two places where people go. But what is Paul's talking here? As if now coming at the end. And listen to what he says. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. So Paul is speaking in the typology of Christ in these scenarios. And now what is the third time? The third time is, is Christ in this typology. Is Christ coming? So you have a taking away, a taking, and a coming. So it's when he comes, what's going to happen? 
This is the exact same as, as, uh, as Revelation chapter 11 at the seventh trumpet. When he comes and they destroy all the enemies, then what? These guys receive their reward and they're going to be resurrected. Because it was their promise. So when we see that Jews say that they don't believe in heaven, that's because they're not going to the heaven. They're not going to the third heaven or, or to the paradise in the way we understand these things. Because Judah's portion is a different portion. These are all them right here. It's the bride of Christ that goes to the third heaven. It's those who were watching and praying, right? Those that were diligent like Enoch, okay? Who believed that he was God, who were diligently seeking him, who loved him and loved others. We're watching and praying. This is the third heaven group. It's the taking away going to the third heaven. The second group is caught up, and where do they go? Well, they go to paradise. You see, when Christ comes on paradise, remember what he said in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, starting in verse 2, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So what did he say? In my Father's house. That's what? The kingdom of God? Hello. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Well, we know John's gospel has opened to us, right? The book of John has revealed. So where when you hear me talking about the, the who the gospels are speaking to with Luke, Mark, and Matthew being like the seven we're in right now coming to an end. And then you got seven years for Mark and seven years for Matthew. You say, well, where's the where's John? Well, isn't it interesting that John's not called one of the synoptic gospels? Okay, John stands on his own. And it just so happens in the revelation of the end, it's the synoptic gospels that reveal the timing of each group. Yet it's John who stands on his own who gives us the whole picture. Meaning within his chapters, there are events that take place within these years. <clears throat> within this end time years. And what happens when you go to chapter 14 of John? Well, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place in my father's kingdom that when I return, I will receive you unto myself. So he went to go and prepare a place for everybody. For whose group? The Mark group. He went to prepare, prepare a place for those who would be in the rapture group, in the was caught up, going to paradise. Because when he comes at the end of the six years of seals, and he's here in the seventh year of seals at the time of the rapture. Look at what it is. It's chapter 14 of John. When he's going to receive them in his father's house, where many mansions are that he went to go and prepare, which is the portion of the kingdom of God, which is paradise. So we know that there's a group that goes to paradise. Are they the only ones in paradise? Does it only apply to the end of days group? No. We know that from Christ, there are those who go to paradise as well. Check it out. The difference for those who go to paradise, watch this. Uh, Luke chapter 23. <coughs> Luke chapter 23, we got the thief on the cross, right? Uh, where are you? 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 Here it is right here. Uh, let's start from verse 40. Luke 23, starting in verse 40. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Doth not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? So what did this, what did one do? One's being an idiot and not believing who he is, not understanding. And the other one is correcting his, his other thieving friend and saying, Do you not fear God? Seeing that you're in the same condemnation? So what is he saying? He's acknowledging that Christ is God. Not God the Father, God the Son. Okay? He's acknowledging that Jesus is God. 
That right there is the acknowledgement that he says, oh my goodness, what are we doing in the same condemnation as God? So in that moment, he has accepted Christ as his Savior. He recognized who he was. In verse 41, it says, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Hello. Who gets to go to paradise? Those who believe in Christ, right? Those that believe he's God. Did this guy have time to get baptized? Right? I believe baptism, the water baptism is important. It's the reason why it's in Acts chapter 2. It's the difference between uh, um, the revelation as we taught being baptized in Jesus Christ's name, right? For the remission of sins and the receiving of the Holy Ghost compared to, excuse me, compared to uh, uh, the one at the end of Matthew, which has to do for Judah at the end of days. It's not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost isn't for us. But you see, this, this guy never had, he, never, he wasn't baptized. He didn't get to go and watch and pray always and diligently seek and love the Lord. So is so if he didn't get the chance to do all those things, yet believed, where where would he go? Just like it says, to paradise. If those who are watching and praying believe in the Lord, loving and seeking him, giving him thanks, and their time comes, do you think they're going to go to paradise? No. They're going to the third heaven. The third heaven is that is that top area, right? It's the it's the top portion. It's so what are we seeing? There's three places where people go. And what do they relate to in every case? Luke, Mark, and Matthew. What's going to happen in the end of days during the time of the sleeping church as this great revival breaks out? Are they, uh, they, they, they cry out as, as an earthquake and they're about to be swallowed up by the earth and they realize, oh, and they, they cry out, forgive me, Lord, sorry, forgive me. And they, they truly mean it in their heart, not just a, a thing of fear, but they truly mean it because they knew who he was. They, they knew who he was, but they, they didn't really, they weren't diligent with anything. They occasionally went to church and went and did their parties and everything. So what's going to happen during seals? And if they die, but they cried out to the Lord with a true repentance, where are they going? They're going to go to paradise. You see? This is why what we're reading from first, uh, 2 Corinthians 12 is the second group goes to paradise. What we're reading, let me make this even more clear for everybody. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when we are reading this in the end time eyes, what we are reading is those who are still alive at that moment. Maybe that helps clarify it even more. You see, we've been talking about this number of 8 billion. This, this revelation that we've known here for like three and a half years that I believe it was 8 billion at the flood. It'll be 8 billion at the escape in the beginning of the end of days. And it'll be 8 billion at the end of the millennial reign. It's the number of Christ. It'll be 888. Now, when I say that, it's the alive people. I don't know if it means pregnant or if it means born. Um, it would appear that it means born because if you take the number of those who are pregnant, then I think even right now, well, you know what? Actually, it might still be born as well. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, pregnant as well. So, some point this year, I believe by <laughs> mid is June, we will reach exactly 8 billion people, however the Lord counts it, alive or in the womb. And I mean, in the womb seems to make a lot more sense, right? With, uh, with the Lord's view and what we understand compared to abortion and, and so on and so forth. Life begins in the womb. So what we're talking about 
is the group going to the third heaven, that Luke group, okay? Those who are watching and praying to be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's the group alive that will experience what Enoch experienced. But in the last 2,000 years, those that have died in Christ, loving Christ, you know, believed, had been baptized, uh, um, had the Holy Spirit, they're already there in the third heaven. Remember, Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So, if to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord, yet Abraham and Daniel and those guys were still lying in their plot, or, you know, in particular, the way it said it with Daniel, and waiting till the time of the end, that portion is different. So, all those Old Testament and the Judah people, they're waiting for their portion at the end, so they're going to be lying in their plot. The, the house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in. They're waiting, they're, they're, or their portion is paradise. Meaning in the last 2,000 years, those who believe and just believed in that, in that fashion, they're in paradise. Okay? That's why there's confusion when people say, all we got to do is call out on his name and believe in Jesus Christ. Well, not really, <laughs> you know, am I saying that, oh, that's just the easy way and you can still get to paradise? Well, no, if you believe in him, if you called out and you truly believe in him, and you consider that now in the end of days, there's not going to be all of this abundant water and all this ability to go water baptism and do all these things. It's the difference of the three groups. It's the Luke, Mark, and Matthew throughout all of history. The Old Testament guys are waiting for their promise at the end. They're Judah. They were God's creation, the third group, the Matthew group. As I said, that's why we're praying for them. That's why we lift them up and we're grateful for their, for their fall, for their blindness. To allow, to, so that God can use us to make them jealous. And that means that anybody who has died in in the in the in just believing in Christ or you know maybe lying in their in their on their deathbed lying in the hospital and they've been pondering Christ while lying there and they're soon to die and they didn't quite realize it but they had given their life to Christ in that moment where do you think that person is that person's in paradise remember the thief on the cross was no different but those who had a time to live out their lives, to seek and to love and diligently seeking the Lord. They go to the third heaven. Same with the ones that have already passed. They're in the third heaven. You understand, there's, these different groups are the groups of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. It's always been three. So there are three places where people go at death. Or I should say four. <laughs> there are three believing groups or groups that belong to the Lord in some fashion in, in the big picture of the, of the Spirit, the Son, and the Father. In the three-third thrice, in the three-six-nine, in, in the, the whole understanding and that revelation all the way back to creation. And for all the rest, they go to hell. So hopefully that helps you guys... Uh, uh, understand. I know people have had questions with that in the past, and I've never really gotten into it because I was still trying to to see this part with paradise compared to the rest. And now it's pretty darn clear because everything is in threes, okay? And the unbeliever is in hell, just like the story of uh, uh, um, Abraham and 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 uh, the the Lazarus beggar that's in his bosom and the rich man that's in hell. This is where they are. So hopefully that'll that'll bring some clarity to some people and strengthen their understanding along the way. Now let's go to the next part. This is where um, we were sharing in the live show, and I've spoken about it too. With uh, uh, it was it was uh, Yanni who had shared this with me, our Greek brother, and when we were going through it. it I started sharing and adding more things to it because I just thought it was so awesome. And he shared with me that that one of the 
very, very important numbers in Judaism is the number 18. In fact, I think there are four. They have four very important numbers. They have four and 40 kind of working together. Seven <laughs> is for obvious reasons, right? And then there's 18. And 18, we know, is very, very important as well. Uh, for them, it has to do with life. Okay, so they give a blessing, that, which is the word for 18, and it means life and so forth. Now, we have shared on these things uh, in the live show and before too, in relation to what we were talking about with 369. And I was sharing it with you guys earlier, so I'm not going to say it all over again. But we have this one of the keys to the universe. Just like we say, you want a, you want a key to the Bible, you want a key to unlock the word. It is the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. Then you begin to understand the 14 years and the portion of time, the 50 days that comes before the 14 years. It's everything begins to open up. It's a key as well. And it's lined up with this 369 key as well. Okay. It, it's quite fascinating. And what you realize, of course, is that 3, 6, and 9 also equals 18. And this is what we were saying earlier. So you have 369, you got the portion of Luke, the portion of Mark, the portion of Matthew. You've got the creation with the Holy Ghost, which is the gap theory, a portion of time that flew by quickly. You've got the creation within days, which related to the creation of the world, the creature, right? The one that, that the Lord made, and it was the days that were as thousands. That's the Mark group. And then you've got Matthew. And in the Matthew group, it was from the from the forming of, uh, of, uh, of Adam. And we know Christ is the second or the last Adam. You're going to see when he's the last Adam, all right? And it relates to the 7,000 as seven years for Matthew from Adam till the end. So it's always the threes. Seven, 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 21, Luke, Mark, Matthew. Okay? Spirit, Son, Father. Over and over and over again. But who's in all three of them? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Three, third, thrice. It's three. Three and three is six. Three and three, and three which is six, plus three is nine. Three, six, nine. <laughs> it's just, it's wild. And then what are we talking about? So this is what we're going to get into a bit more, which is the number 18, which is so important to the Jews. Well, we also know in the end time revelation of the, of the big picture of the seven and seven, there was also this Jacob easy seven years, right? Fast passing years. This is the Luke portion. Then he got, he was expecting to get Rachel, but got Leah. Okay. That's who we are. This is the bride of Christ that's going to be taken out. So the story is really 20 years. Just like when we say 13, he returns feet down at the end of 20 or at the at the end of 13. They equal the same thing. And you could say, or the start of the 21st or the start of the 14th, which is the seventh trumpet, where we saw him saying now everything was his. And the wrath was being was coming and being poured out on all the enemies. So what do we see? <coughs> we see that this portion of trumpets, we see it's 18. So there's the 18. So what are we to know? What can we understand from this 18? Well, what was also interesting with 18 is that, of course, 18 can be divided by six three times, right? Six, six, six. Yikes. And that's because, as I was saying, it's the copy of what the enemy does, trying to copy the Lord. But he can't have the same 333, the same 369 connection. So he's taken 666 in corrupting man, right? And what happens in 18? What happens in the 18th year or in the 14-year version, which is the seven years of seals and the seven years of trumpets, what happens? Right here is literally the discourse of Matthew as we were sharing earlier. Let me bring you back to it. In Matthew's discourse, this right here, the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. Okay? 
When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. This is where they're to flee. What is this standing in the holy place? It's right here. It's about three and a half years into trumpets, which is in the 11th year. And if you go to the story of John's gospel, you see this is where Christ is being cut off. It's where he's being given into the hands, uh, uh, where he's taken into the hands of sinful men. Okay, Judas, he's taken into the hands of sinful men. And it's a story of what? Him being cut off his crucifixion to his resurrection, which would be what? If this was only half the year, because it's 10 and a half, which is in the halfway through the 11th year, then it would be a half a year, all of 19 to the end of 20 would be two and a half years of Messiah being cut off. Why? Because in the 18th year, Satan is cast down. It's Revelation, check this out. It's Revelation chapter 12. We can show it perfectly. Okay, there's your seals, Revelation 12, 1 to the 12, 5, right up to the point of the rapture. You have the woman fleeing in the wilderness. Okay, whatever that woman portion is for 1260 days, this is the first half of trumpets. And I believe it relates to the false prophet and those that are still around with the false prophet. And what happens during this 1260 days, the first half of trumpets, there's the war with Michael and his angels against the dragon and his. They lose and they're cast down to the earth. Satan is cast down to the earth and with them his angels. And all of heaven is now rejoicing. But then they say, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Why woe? Because the fifth trumpet is the first woe. So they're cast down to the earth. And he's coming with great wrath because he knows he has but a short period of time. Then he goes after this woman. So where are we now? Seven years of seals are done. Three and a half years of trumpets with the 1260 is when he's cast down. So where would we be? In the 11th year, 10 and a half years in to all of tribulation, which is the mid part of trumpets. And what happens? He goes after the woman. This is where Judah, those that were with the Lord on, on, in, in Jerusalem when it was being rebuilt, they're now flying away on the wings of a great eagle into the wilderness to a place prepared where she is nursed for a time, comma, and times, comma, and half a time. That's one plus two plus a half for a total of three and a half years. So a total of three and a half years, if it's half of the tenth of the, uh, uh, a ten and a half years, which is half of the eleventh year, and it goes three and a half years, that would go to the end of fourteen. So she's now taken into the wilderness to the end of the fourteenth year to a place protected. But it started in the eighteenth year, in the halfway through the eighteenth year, or in the fourteen years in the eleventh year. Okay? So we see that this is again directly at the same time of the year 18 or 11, but in the big picture, because the big picture is really the whole story. Remember, the big picture is also a typology of creation from in the beginning to the end. So from the day one to the 22, 22nd thousandth year when it's all over, it's the beginning and the end, the Aleph and the Tav, the Alpha and the Omega. Okay, the beginning of Revelation, the end of Revelation, the beginning of the Hebrew alphabet, the end of the Hebrew alphabet. So 18, as we're seeing, is a very important portion of time. When we go now to Daniel, let's go to Daniel and catch this one real quick too. You go to Daniel chapter 12. So if we take the time, end times, and half a time, when we come to Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, and he says, how long this craziness this craziness that I saw in my vision because it's when Satan has been cast down. How long is it going to last? And it says it shall be for a time, times, and a half. There's no addition here. There's an and here, a comma and an and, but here there's only a comma and no and. So you're not adding one plus two plus a half. You're saying one, two, and a half. One, two, plus a half. 
which means Satan's time is two and a half years. And you can understand now Satan's time of ruling and this short time and the craziness that he's going to wreak is two and a half years, which takes us to the end of the 20 or end of the 13, which you can say is also the same as saying the start of the 21st or the start of the 14th. And what did we see at the seventh trumpet? We saw the Lord saying everything was now his, ruling in heaven and on earth. It's all his. What do we see in John chapter 20? We see Christ having returned, saying that he rose again from the dead. Because in the end time story of John, with Luke, Mark, and Matthew in the synoptics revealing the end times three groups, and John standing alone also built into his gospel, the revelation of the end, we see Messiah cut off two and a half years in, then return, uh, sorry, with two and a half years to the end of the of the uh, uh, um, sixth trumpet. And then what do we see in the 20th chapter? Him returning again from the dead, it said. And we knew that he had to be cut off from Daniel 9. So we're seeing this 18 and how important this 18 is. Well, let me take it to you into the fractal. This is a chart that our brother Ivan from South Africa did, and I'm so grateful for this chart. It's it's perfect. Watch this. When I'm talking about these three groups, because everything is threes, what do we have? The group that was over the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God was over in that gap creation, which is believed the Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Then in verse 3 of Genesis, you had Christ being called, being made light. So in Genesis 1, verse 1, you had in the beginning. Okay, Christ is that beginning. Let me go to that real quick. Uh, 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 where do I want to go? It was this video right here. It was such an exciting video right here. The beginning, the light, the flesh. Mind-blowing video. And why was it so important? Because Christ is the beginning. Okay? Genesis chapter 1, Christ, as we said, just like the Feast of First Fruits, Christ is the 7225. So God created all things through Christ. So it was Christ that made it all in the will of his Father. That's why it says, in the beginning or in Christ, God created. So here's Christ, the beginning. But then what? Then God said, let there be light, and, it, and there was light. Who was this light? Christ was this light. So he was the beginning, then he was the light, and then he was what? Made flesh. What do you have? All three groups. <laughs> all three groups again, all right? <laughs> so what are we seeing? Over the spirit realm, the light realm, and the flesh realm. Okay? These are the three groups. This is why the, the co-heirs with Christ. We, don't, we can't say, oh, look at here. It says it was seven days or as 7,000 years. It's a gap. It's, it's a mystery portion. Just like the escape of the bride of Christ is this mystery portion of time. This mystery group of people that, that are dedicated to the Lord. This mystery escape. The rapture isn't a mystery. Revelation chapter 7 is crystal clear of the great multitude in the rapture. So this is the escape. And, and the thing is, is how do we know that the gap creation is a seven year or seven days or, or 7,000 typology portion? Because of Daniel. Uh, sorry, sorry, because of Jacob. He worked seven years or typology days to the Lord or 7,000 in the big picture. And then he got his first bride. He was expecting Rachel, but got Leah. That's the escape typology. Then you had seven. And what happens in the seven after the six years? What happens in the seventh year? The rapture. The great multitude rapture of the world group that he created, you see, that Christ was over. As light. And then you had the father who created his people. See that portion of Judah that we're talking about. This is that big picture of the to the Lord days. The whole thing will be like 21 days to the Lord. But to man in the dimension of time, it would be as if 21,000 years. So what you're seeing in this big picture of thousands of years typology 
when you see this, these two lines that make this big triangle here, this is right towards the end of the 6,000 years from Adam, okay, from the, from the fall of Adam, 2,000 years from the death and resurrection of Christ, his return. What do we see? There's a time of Luke, Mark, and Matthew playing out, which are the seven years that, like Jacob said, they were fast passing. They, they flew by like days. Just like the gap creation, there's not much said. It flew by because just as Jacob was so excited to work to get his bride and the time flew by, Christ was so excited to be creating. You see, the same typology. And so those seven flew by, almost unrecognizable. They were just so quick. That's the typology. And so what do we see? Where are we now? We believe by June of this year is this first seven coming to an end, which is the escape of the bride of Christ. Then you've got the seven of seals and the seven of trumpets. So just like looking at this, these seven will be done. And then you've got the seven of seals and you've got the seven of trumpets. Okay. Now, remember, we're talking about this 18 thing, right? Watch this. When Christ created, when the males and females were created in the time of days on the sixth day, which we know to God the Father, days are as thousands, okay? So to him it was days, but in the dimension of time it would have been as thousands. And then the Father said what? In, in 2 Peter, we'll talk on it in a second when I make a point of the last thing I'm going to show. So in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, he said, days are unto the Lord as thousands, right? Or a day is as a thousand years. So that means to the Lord, it's days. But to man in the dimension of time, it would be a thousand years. And then he reverses it. And we're told that a thousand years is with the Lord as a day. And so here we have in Genesis 1, the creation story to the beginning of Genesis 2, the creation story in days. Well, that means this creation story to the Father, which was like days, to us in time would have been as thousands. And then here we are now in this dimension of time from Adam, and we're coming close to this end right here, this portion of time about right here. And we're in the dimension right now of time. So we're living in the thousands from Adam. But he said that these thousands are unto him as days. So you have days as thousands and you have thousands as days. So to the Lord, it'll be seven days and seven days. To man, it would be 7,000 and 7,000. It's the dimension of time. Okay, now watch this. So understanding that you have your Zakar and Nekba which is the male and female that were created on day six, and you have Adam and Eve that were called Ish and Isha, why weren't this the same? The same man and the same woman, but they have different names for their types because they're not the same. Okay? This was the creation of days. And look at what happens here. Keeping in mind, we're talking about 18, right? Look at what happens. These people are created on the sixth day. So at the start of the sixth day, you have the males and females that were created. Christ comes from Adam and Eve, or from Adam, Christ comes and fulfills his death and resurrection on the cross being 4,000 years, right? Being 4,000 years from Adam and Eve, or from Adam in particular. And he fulfills, but he fulfills what? Is he fulfilling the fall from Adam? Well, no, he's not fulfilling the fall from Adam. He's coming to save the world, he said. He died for the sins of the world. This is where he created his world. And the people that were created in it were right here. This is the Mark group. You see how the time, all, the time lines up directly? The time of the seven years is the same as the seven days or 7,000 here. And so from the thousand count, from when they were created being the 6,000th, 
and then the seventh thousandth rest is the sixth day and the seventh day. And then you've got from Adam's creation, and you got one, two, three, four. The total was 6,000 years from the males and females to when Christ came to rescue them. It was 6,000 years. And when he came to rescue them in the 6,000th year, what was it in the big picture? Seven days, seven days, and four days. Right? Or you have what? 7,000 and 7,000 and 4,000. What is it? 18,000th year. In the 18,000th year, Christ came for the people that he had lost, that were fallen, corrupted to the to, to Lucifer, who had denounced the Holy Spirit, who had spoken against the Spirit. That's why they can never be saved, those that were fallen with them. They can never be saved because they spoke against, they went against the Spirit of God who was over the first group. That's why just like us, anybody who rebukes and, and comes against the Holy Spirit, it's the one unforgivable sin. That's why these guys can never be saved who fell from that. And they came and corrupted the males and the females, the creature creation. And so what happens? Christ comes 6,000 years later. And what does he tell the Jews? So Adam and Eve group, which is the 6,000 that I said earlier that we're a part of, which is why we're, we're to give them thanks and to, and, to, and to lift them up and to pray for them because we're living in their portion, just like I said. Did Christ come to save them, Judah? No. He said he was coming for Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said he was coming for the world, which is the Gentiles grafted in within it as well. And it was what? The total from the beginning was the 18,000th year, 6,000 years from their fall that he came to save them. But then guess what? I just was able to show you that the number 18 is so important in that when Messiah is going to be cut off again, and it's equal to when he's taken into the hands of sinful men. And if you go to Zechariah 11, it's when Messiah is cut off and he breaks the covenant that he makes when he comes at the end of seals. He destroys, as you know, the Antichrist, right? The Antichrist is killed. The, the, the kings are, they, they were wounded. They lose their, 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 um, their dominions. And then he makes a peace. He's Melchizedek, right? Destroys the enemies. And then is the, is the Melchizedek high priest and king. But then what happens? Satan is cast down in this 11th or in the big picture 18th year. And when Satan is cast out, Messiah is cut off. That's exactly what you read about in Zechariah 11. He's got to break his covenant that he made because Satan, the vintage of old, has been cast down. So here we are. Talking about 18 in the big picture of thousands. When Christ came in the 4,000th for our dimension or for our thousands of years. But in the big picture it was the 18,000th. But if he still has to do it again. Because he's going to do it for Judah's group. Remember they were blinded. They were blinded. <coughs> do you get it? They were blinded. This is God's people. The Jews, they've been blinded. So what's going to happen? 6,000 years later, okay, right around 6,000 years later, where are we? In this portion right here. This is right to the very end. These are the last 21 years to the end of the 6,000 years. Look, from Adam's fall to Christ coming and doing it again, because the Judah group was blinded and they still have to be saved. Guess what? How many years? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Soon where we are now, we're looking for June, the escape of the bride of Christ. Seven years of seals, which is 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th. In that 14th year, you have the rapture, the plucked off group, which is who? This group now over. 
this group that was created in the sixth day, when the six years of seals are over, in the seventh year they're taken for what? The cross, the sacrifice Christ had already made for them on the cross at the 18,000th year. This group is now taken. It's the end of the Gentile age. It's the end of the age for the world. But then what? He's, what about another being taken away, another sacrifice, a cutting off for Christ, uh, for, for Judah, for the ones God created, right? For Adam. Well, look at what happens. You take another 6,000 years in this story, as we said, and you come to this again, and look at what happens. You had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, escape of the bride of Christ. One, two, three, four, five, six. And in the seventh year, the rapture takes place. This group is now finished with. And then what? That's 14 years of the easy or fast passing, the loot group. You got the seven years of seals coming to an end. And then you've got what? The seven years of trumpets. And what is it? The 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th year, which is what? The same as the 11 in the seven of seals and seven of trumpets. And look at this word again. This is where Messiah is cut off right towards the end of the 6,000 years. And when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, it'll be what? The 6,000th year. Having fulfilled the one for the first creation world within days of the group for Mark, and then fulfilling the again for those that were blinded, he's now coming to save the group from Adam. And Christ was called what? The last Adam. When does it all take place? There it is right here. In the 18th year of the revelation of the end of days, which is the in the big picture of the 21 years, in the seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, it's the 11th year. And in the big picture of all this creation of it, what was it? The 18,000th year. So the first time was the 18,000th year, the last time in the year count. There's the big picture. The first time was the 18,000th. Here's the end time in the year picture, and it'll be in the 18th year. Come on. Come on. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you see when we say how this stuff will freak you out when you begin to understand it? See, the 18th or the 11th, it's the same story. Messiah is now going to be cut off for them who had been blinded. And when does he come back? At the end of 20 or the beginning of 21st. You can say it's the same thing. He returns feet down on the Mount of Olives and this time the whole world will see him. It's the 18. And the enemy copying it. Because at that point, when the pit is opened and the son of perdition return, the son of perdition comes. All 18. What's he going to be doing? What's 18 equal? Life. Because in his death and resurrection in the 18th year is what? Life for everyone else. So exciting. So, so awesome. Now watch this. I'm leading into that, into that 18 as well because of what our brother Yanni had found. And what it is, is in uh, Luke 21, verse 28. This is where we've been talking about this a lot lately, right? With the stone's throw. And it's getting more and more intense because we're, we're in this time frame. It's about to come, guys. The end of days will begin with all of us before the escape, seeing something coming from above, which will probably be some meteor or maybe even a group or one larger one breaking up, this is what we will all see coming. It is Luke starting uh, Luke 21 in his discourse, starting in verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Okay? Not the on that means in, the on that is an attacking arriving. There's going to be something that super, in, in, uh, super in, uh, what is it? Supervenes upon the earth. Because the powers of heaven shall be shaken. 
This is what we've been proclaiming for four years, Psalms 18, okay, or three and a half years. Psalms 18 is going to come first. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud, okay? This is going to be in a cloud. The whole world's not going to see him. Only those who are his, only the bride of Christ, the sons of God, those with the Spirit of God in them, who were ready, watching, praying, seeking him. The whole world won't see him because he's in a cloud still at this point, okay? It's the word in. But then look at what it says. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, which is the opposite of that movie, right? The meteor's coming, six months and 14 days from when it was released, equals June 19th, 2022, from when the movie was released, December 5th, 2021. It said, don't look up. This one says, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. This word redemption is only found in the Gospel of Luke, not Mark, not Matthew, not even in their discourses in particular is where it should where it should be, and it's not, because they're not a part of this. Okay, that's the left behind, and the other one is Judah, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And so the word look up, and this is what Yanni had shared. Look at look at this. It only shows up four times. Now for us, that is that is such a, a beautiful thing because we know something else that it only showed up uh, um, four times that was extremely powerful for us to understand. And that was the what we shared earlier with the Feast of First Fruits, or sorry, sorry, with the Feast of Weeks of the First Fruits of the Wheat Harvest and the Feast of Ingathering, which was the 614 to 622. And it said, at the year's end. We found out it was the course of the sun. It only shows up four times. And in all places it shows up, it is directly related to the solstice, to the time of the escape and the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. It's a key place we've been trying to understand for the last few years, and now we've got it. Now we understand it. And that's what we were talking about. It's that from the, the solstice, and then bang, that that day, that next day, the 21st and the 22nd is the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man at the year's end. That's why Psalms 19, which follows directly after the events of Luke 21 that we were re just reading, it's Psalms 19. When they see him coming, the bride is gone, and what happens? He begins his 40 days. So it was a key piece of scripture for us to see this 40 days, uh, sorry, to see this four times and now to understand where it is. Well, when Yanni shared this, that this look up portion of Luke chapter 21, which is connected to the escape of the bride, and it only showed up four times, it was a matter of seeing, okay, well, where are these four times? And that's when it gets exciting. You know, it means to unbend which means it was those who were bent over. It was those on their knees that were seeking the Lord. That for them to now look up, okay? And those who look up will be elated. Those who don't know what the word elated means, it means to be ecstatically happy. Hello. That's the bride of Christ, isn't it? To be ecstatically happy. To be elated. And the opposite of this word, see the reversal will be what will happen. There will be those who were already on their knees and they will be elated because it's time to go. And then you're gonna have those who will be the opposite form of those who were on their knees now rising up. It will be those who weren't bent over who will now bend forward, okay? It'll be the beginning of the time of tribulation, still that 40, 50 day portion. And then it'll be the beginning of the 14 years. Now watch this. Let's see why this is so important. Why, why does this look up? Why is it so important to us? Because we have been showing now for three plus years that this stone's throw, that this connection to this time here is directly connected to the revelation you read only in Luke chapter 22, not in any of the other uh, uh, going to the crucifixion stories. Only in... Luke 22, do we read the story of the stones cast or the stones throw? 
This is Jesus saying he is a stone's throw away. A very strange thing to say. It's one of those things that you're like, well, why would he bother saying a stone's throw away? I, it, it, it's, it, it's a mystery, really, right? Well, it was a mystery. We've understood it now for a while. He could have said that he was just like with a, within an earshot away or whatever the case may be. But no, he said a stone's throw. And we've been teaching for the longest time that this stone's throw away that he's talking about is this stone right here being spoken about when the bride is, is going to be now standing before him. Now, listen to what it says. In John chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, it's the same wording that you see at the end of Luke's discourse. So let's start with that. At the end of Luke's discourse, first of all, it says, uh, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that, so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare, remember, they're going to be caught in a snare. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. The whole earth is going to freak out. Okay? The snare is the escape and the stone's throw that's coming. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So you're praying to be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are going to come to pass. So we're going to see this. But we're not going to be affected by it because when we see him coming, we will know that our redemption is about to take place. And the, in the story of the fig tree, guess what? Look at, <laughs> this is so awesome. Wait till you see this. We also have the story of the fig tree, right? And behold, the fig tree and all the trees. Know when they shoot forth and you see and know for yourselves that summer is nigh at hand. Well, when is summer nigh at hand? At the solstice, okay? At the solstice is the summer, okay? This is the first day of summer. This is when it begins. But guess what? The stone's throw is going to be, I believe, right in this time of the 19th. Within this beginning of the first seven days of the 50. But according to that, it's before summer so when summer is nigh at hand meaning it's right there it's very near at hand well the stone's throw according to the count if you take the resurrection story you have from when he was on the mount taken into the hands of sinful men crucified and resurrected what happens at this time of the resurrection in the typology? Yes, this is the 50-day count. We're not talking from, the, from the, the crucifixion story. Passover is already done. This is for the bride of Christ with the Holy Spirit time, right? What ends up happening? This relates to his covenant. It's the typology in the Gospels. So what do we have? The stone's throw in chapter 22 and then the resurrection of the bride of Christ. It was the resurrection of Christ, but what else was it? Well, in Luke chapter 24, it said, and his body was not found. That's the beginning of the 40 days. Boom, the body's not found. And it's the son of man beginning his 40 days. So two and a half days approximately earlier is what? The stone's throw being seen. When he said he's a stone's throw away. See how crazy that is? So he's a stone's throw away, and we know that it's when summer's coming. So when summer is just right at hand, and it would be what? Related to the fig tree and all the trees. So see, the fig tree or the fig tree generation, which is not only Jerusalem, it's Israel when they got the land. You'll start to understand these things. So connected to the fig tree, it's almost summer. It's a stone's throw away. The body is not found. And look at what we see. Okay. Watch and pray always that you be accounted worthy. And then it ends with 37, verse 37 and 38 in Luke 21. And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple. And at night, he went out and abode in the mount that is called the, uh, the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. Let's go to John chapter 8. 
the conversation now of this adulterous woman who is a, it was the typology of the Gentile now standing before the Lord. And look at how John 8 starts. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and sat down and he taught them. The same type of wording from the end of Luke's discourse and what was before it. Watch and pray always for the bride of Christ to be accounted worthy, right? To escape all these things. And look at what we see in verse 3. John 8, starting in verse 3. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say, uh, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And Moses, uh, now Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, tempting him that they might have uh, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he had not heard them. All right. What does he end up saying? So now what do you have this imagery? There's all these people around. There's this woman in adultery, which is a type of meaning of Gentile, like a dog can mean Gentile. A woman in adultery can mean Gentile, okay? It doesn't mean we're a bunch of fornicating, you know, adulterers or anything like that. It's the typology of a Gentile. Just like I said in the live show, and I shared it before, Ruth, she says, why have you taken such an interest? Why have you been so kind to this stranger? The word stranger, and she's referring to herself. It means an adulteress, okay? Ruth wasn't an adulteress. It was a definition for a Gentile. And so what does Jesus say here in John 8, verse 7, as we continue? So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself. But look, it's not, it's not the same lifted up. Oh, it is the same lifted up. Well, how about that? <laughs> let's, <clears throat> let's highlight this one. Okay. He lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin, let him cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it began uh, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in his midst. So there's Jesus bent over. And he looks up and there's only his bride standing before him, like she's proposing to him, right? Only the Gentile woman standing before him. <clears throat> and when Jesus lifted himself up, oh, what? There it is again. It's only used four times. And here's the second. So now there's two times right here in John 7 and in John 10. Jesus lifted himself up and saw none but the woman and said unto the woman, uh, and said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? What is this a typology of? This is him there with the bride of Christ. And what is it about? The stones throw. So they want to throw stones at her. But Jesus says the only one who can cast a stone at her is the one who is without sin. And so Jesus, being the only one without sin, is the only one that can throw the stone. And here is the word lifted up right here before the wording of him casting the stone or him being the only one who can do it. And then here it is again when it's just him and her, the same word for lifted up. And guess what? Where was the conversation all about? In Luke's discourse about the story of men's hearts failing them for seeing these stones throw coming to the earth. But the bride, who will still be here, because what did it say? Only he who is without sin can cast the first stone at her. Which means Christ is the one who cast the first stone while she was still here, while the bride was still here. But before it hits, the bride is gone. Look up. It's the same word for the same timing of the same event. So here we are. The end of the seven Sabbaths, 
the 50 days then begin. So day one, two, three, four, five, bang. The stone's throw. This is probably when it'll become seen, somewhere in this time frame. And then you've got what? One, two, three, about two and a half to three days later, which will be about two and a half days later, which is the connection from the stone's throw away that Jesus said he was to the escape when we look up, when what? Summer that was nigh at hand at this point is now here and the bride is now taken and the son of man begins his 40 days. It's the story of Luke chapter 21 to John 8 with the direct connection of what? Chapter 7 to the beginning of chapter 8, which is the escape of the bride of Christ, the 40 days of the son of man, and then the beginning of tribulation. It's all there in order. Over and over and over, proving the revelation of the open books each and every single time. But see, remember, we were talking about 18 as well. So we're not quite done. Let's tie this into 18. Oh, in fact, as we get to the point of tying it into 18, actually, you know what? I do want to tie it into 18. Let me show you this. We were talking here about this look up. And all of this looking up is all connected to the stone's throw. But we just covered Luke 21, verse 28, John 8, verse 7, John 8, verse 10 all directly connected to what? The timing of the stone's throw. Okay? This timing of the stone's throw and our conversation about 18. But do you realize that there is more than one 18? Okay? There's this 18 which is connected to the time of the Jews, the, the house of Judah, which has the big 21,000 imagery, or 18,000, and to the 18th year of the end of days in this big picture of it. But do you know that there's another 18 and a 118 that begins it all? Psalms 18 slash 118. I've been talking about Psalms 18 since 2018. It will be what begins everything. And it is exactly what we were just talking about. We were just sharing how everything relating to 18 and how important this number 18 is and how it relates to this all of creation and into the end of days 18, which is also the 11th year. But isn't it funny that it will all begin with an 18? Because we've been teaching for the longest time that it is Psalms 18 there's a dual portion with Psalms. You can do it from 18 and 118. It's different perspectives because of the two groups, right? So what do we see? Look at the destruction. Look at the devastation that's coming. He hears me crying, the compassing. I'm being compassed about, surrounded by death. The Lord, I cry in my distress, and the Lord hears from his temple in heaven. And then what happens? The earth shook and trembled. The foundation of the hills were shaken, were moved. And we're shaken because he was wroth. What is this? This is Luke chapter 21. This is 21 verse 25 to the portion of 28. Coals were kindled, right? He bows. He's going to bow the heaven and come down. What do we see? Christ coming on a cloud, right? He did fly upon a cherub. He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion, dark waters round about. Coals of fire. The channels of water will be seen. The foundations of the world will be discovered at his rebuke. Because it's going to be what? Devastation of water once this impact comes to. And as it gets close, as he's approaching, the earth is going to quake and shake. It's going to rip apart somewhere. And it's going to cause what? Massive amount of water. It's going to be the tsunami stuff, right? It's going to be this impact as well. And it's going to cause this devastation of water. This is Psalms 18. Well, you want to see why it's so crazy? Because the fourth place, or the first one that it's listed, where this lift up is found, is in Luke chapter 13. In Luke chapter 13, verse 11, I shared on Luke chapter 18, 
back all the way back in 2018. And it's because the only place you see the word 18, it might be hard for you guys to see, but I wanted to make sure I didn't miss it, is the word 18, 18, and where's the other one? Where's the other one? Come on now. In three places, it has the word 18, and I don't know where I why I didn't highlight the other one as much. Right here. And 18. Maybe I'll give that one just a darker green then. So in three places, you have the word 18. Isn't that strange? I've always found it strange that it uses the word 18 three times in this one chapter of Luke, knowing that at the time of 2018, when we were teaching on these things, knowing that it will all begin with Psalms 18, and now we come to find out how important the number 18 is in Judaism, and we see that in all of creation and to the end of days, the importance of 18, that when it all begins, it will begin with 18, with Psalms 18. I always found it interesting that Luke chapter 13 had the word 18 in it three times. Because when you go and do a search on 18, we shared this in the live show, it shows up 22 times in the whole Bible. But guess what? In the New Testament, it only shows up three times, and all three times are in Luke 13. All three of them. That is significant. So you want to know why it was so significant? You want to know why it brings so much more interest to us now? Because remember, we, we were talking in Luke chapter 21, and it was the parable of the fig tree. And when you see the fig tree and summer is near, and how that all equaled June, well, guess what? The parable of the fig tree is here in Luke chapter 13, verse 6 and 7. Okay, or the parable from uh, from 13, 6 through 9. You guys remember this one? A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. And this is Jesus telling the story, right? Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, which generally relates to the father, behold, these three years. So from 1948, Okay, from 1948, behold these three years, I am come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. So he's been going to Israel and he finds none. They say, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also. Uh, let it alone this year also till I shall dung it, uh, dung about it. Sorry, shall I shall tig about it and dung it. And if it shall bear fruit, well, and if not, then after thou shalt cut it down. Israel became a nation, 1948, okay? The Lord God, we have now understood that the Lord God is counting from when he began his covenant, his very first covenant with man which is the Feast of Weeks, which is Shavuot. And so what happens? 1948, it was in May. But the Lord begins his covenant, not because of when they came into the nation, but his covenant in that year then began at Shavuot. So from 48 to 49, 49 to 50, 50 to 51, 51 to 52, three years and the fourth year dunged. And then what do you begin to count? 70 years. It's the same story as Leviticus 19. When you come into the land that I shall give you and begin to plant all manner of trees, so all trees, but also the fig tree, and you plant all manner of trees, because the Jews were there, it was their land, right? And plant all manner of trees, what ends up happening? The first three years, you can't take from it. And the fourth year is holy to the Lord. Where would be the 70 and the four, or you would say the four and the 70? Right here at the Feast of Weeks. 
You see, it's the Psalms, uh, uh, Luke 18, and uh, sorry, Luke 13, and all these connections to the number 18 being written in here were for a purpose to give us more details of this time that we were looking at for 18. Look at where the word is now for lift up this, this final time. Verse uh, Luke 13, verse 11. And behold, there was a woman which was, uh, which had a spirit of infirmity. Okay, let's see for infirmity. Feebleness, okay? Uh, uh, moral frailty. You can even look at this maybe even like uh, like Leah, right? She had uh, what they call it, like soft eyes. Let's go look at the name Leah. Check this out. Let's go to Genesis uh, 29. Look at what we see about Leah. Let's read Leah's name. Da -da -da -da. Two daughters. Leah, tender-eyed. Look at what Leah's name means. Weary. So Leah, her name means weary. And this woman was what? Was feebleness of mind or body. Okay? It, it's like we're just like, Lord, please. Right? Like the bride of Christ, we're just crying out, Lord, please. We can't take anymore. We want to be done with this. So we've got this same typology going on here with her to the bride of Christ. And look at what it says. Uh, with a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, and was bowed together. So what was she? She was stooped over. She was bent over. What do we talk about? Look at this. She was, she was bowed over and could in no wise lift up herself. And the word is about what? To unbend. When the Lord comes, they will unbend and he will lift them up. He will lift up the woman in infirmity. He will lift up the Gentile bride. He will lift up that adulteress. And we will be what? Elated. Absolutely ecstatic is what it's all about. This is the 18, guys. It's the connection to 18. This is how powerful 18 is. It is everywhere in our end time revelation, in the open books, in the connections to the open books. I mean, this word was only used four times. And the power of where it was used was 100% perfect in the revelation of the end of days. Just like we've been breaking down the whole way. The whole time as we've been breaking it all down equals the exact same time, speaking to the exact same group of people, to the exact same woman at the time of the stone's throw. Do you see what happens next? Check this out. So when we read in Luke chapter 21, this is so awesome. This is exciting. Watch this. It's not exciting for those who will be left. So let's keep those prayers going for them because what do we see? Men's hearts failing them for looking after those things which are coming. You see, we never said the bride is going to experience this stone's throw hitting. But we're going to see it coming. Okay? And that it's those who will then look up, those who are belong to the Lord, that are going to look up, that are going to be removed. When it hits, the bride won't be here which means it'll be what portion of time? It'll be the portion of time for Mark's group. So, you know, when you look at Luke's discourse, it says, these are the black letters because this is Luke saying the report for Mark and for Matthew. They're not for Luke, okay? It says, then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation. This is the time of the red horse rider. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom earthquakes and all these things and fearful sights. And then in verse 12, it says, but before all these, okay? So this is during the that 40, 50 day portion while the son of man is here. And look at when you go to Mark. Go to Mark's discourse, chapter 13. And look at what we see. Uh, starting in verse eight, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. 
These are the beginnings of sorrows. What are the beginnings of sorrows? A lot of these things are the beginnings of sorrows, but what's the last one mentioned as the beginning of sorrows? Troubles. A disturbance, a roiling of water. Do you know, first of all, I just showed you, it wasn't mentioned in, um, in Luke's, nor is it mentioned in Matthew's. It's not mentioned. Do you know why? Because it's talking about the beginning portion of tribulation. Matthew's discourse is to the is to the Jews is the is the second half is the trumpets portion. Mark's is the beginning of tribulation. And if you guys recall this, when we go to Levitic uh, Numbers chapter seven, and we go into the days, we've talked about this many times not too long ago. <clears throat> we showed how the eighth day, which is connected to the escape is the reward of God and the definition of the name. So the definition of the name is reward of God, a rock that is God. So Jesus has ransomed. So on the eighth day, the reward who is Jesus has ransomed. Remember, that's Jesus coming in a cloud and only those who are ready, who are, who are watching, will see him coming. And it's the reward as, as, as Enoch. It's the reward of God. Having ransomed, and that word is only found in Luke 21, verse 28, and not in the other Gospels. You see, now what happens? Go to the ninth day, go to the tenth day, watch this, go to the eleventh day, which would be three more days after the escape, right? Two and a half, three days after the escape, and look at what the words mean. Pajil, which is accident of God, which comes from the meaning impact so the impact by what is called the accident of god which the other name means muddler and comes from the definition of stirring water to trouble to royal water a disturbance of water a troubling of water and we come to mark 13 connected to the time frame of the beginning of tribulation, which is the beginnings of sorrows, and the word troubles is the disturbance of roiling of water, just as three days after the escape. But what happened? We all saw the stone's throw coming first. Isn't that crazy? It's all connected, guys. Perfectly connected. We didn't skip a beat in any of this. And everything is telling us from here to here is the beginning of the end of everything. Everything in life as we knew it is about to change. I know we still got a little ways to go to June, but having the understanding, seeing how the three plus one and the 70 years has brought us to this point. It was that mystery of the 70 years, right? That was such a key thing for us to understand. The 70 years and where the Lord's end, where the year's end was. Those were two very, very key things. And now we've got them both. We got the revelation of Leviticus and we've got the revelation of the circuit of the sun for the year's end. It's awesome. It is so awesome. Now watch this. Let's go to this final part I want to share with you guys. <coughs> and that is in relation to the time of the white horse rider, which we now have shared. We talked, I was sharing you guys just a little bit at the beginning, is the son of man. Okay. This is the son of man. When they see him coming, right? When we see him coming and he's coming, he's going to be the son of man here for 40 days. The white horse rider is the son of man. We've talked about how the bow, you know, some people will say, well, oh, it's toxin, like toxin, and it means of the simplest fabric. We've shared before, too, how it's um, uh, uh, delivered and to be in travail. This is about the portion of time. We've covered that. Let me show you this. So to, to give you a, a very brief recap on the definition of this word with bow is... 
it has to do with the mother, right? And this portion of being in travail. Well, when we go to Revelation chapter 12, this portion in Revelation chapter 12, it says, and she being with child cried travailing in birth. The bride is gone before this travailing begins. The bride is gone, just like Isaiah 66, 7, before she travailed, she brought forth. That's the bride being taken out. That's the bride, the sons of God, those with the spirit of God. They're being taken out, the co-heirs. They're being removed before the travailing begins. And the 40 days of the Son of Man are the travailing in this travailing in birth. The comma and is the separation between his 40 days, the travailing portion, and the pained, which is the first two and a half years of tribulation. That's this, this word pained is the first portion of tribulation, the first half of seals. Okay, it's the first about two and a half years of seals, which is going to be World War Three. Okay, it'll be the nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, peace being removed from the earth, all of that stuff. Okay, and it'll begin after the 50th day when the Holy Ghost comes, gives them that anointing, what we call Acts 2.0, and then the spirit is gone. Okay, peace is then removed from the earth. So travailing in birth is directly related to what? The time of the white horse rider and the 40 days of the Son of Man. That's why the 40 days and the white horse rider time is the time of being in travail. Well, we also know that bow, as I said earlier, relates to when the Lord made the covenant and it was a bow. Even though the definition is described as like a bow and arrow, we know that it was a rainbow. This bow is going to be the spiraling of colors when the Lord is coming on the white horse rider. And only those who are his will see it. We talked about a crown. A crown was given to him. In Song of Solomon, chapter 3, the last verse, uh, last verse or second last verse, we see that at the time of his espousals, this is very important, at the time of his espousals, his mother had given him a crown. And so what are we talking about? The time of the, of the bride of Christ that's been taken when the white horse rider comes, when the son of man comes, is when he's being given a crown by what? By his mother or probably in this case by his father? Remember what happens at this time in the Ministry Revealed book? This is uh, the, the PDF for those who are wondering. This is the PDF version you'll, you'll see that you can download for free. We know that it's the beginning of Ephesus. It's the beginning of the seven churches. This is at the beginning of the 50 days when the Lord is going to choose his apostles and it's referenced to as the day of his espousals. It's the same definition that we read in a uh, uh, Song of Solomon at the end of chapter three when he's crowned by his mother. So all of these are telling us it is related to the Son of Man coming. Every single piece of it. But you know one piece that's always kind of irked me a bit? We talked about it recently, and we just recently showed how the word conquering and to conquer, okay, it's the same one, okay, conquering and to conquer, is this word right here, G3528, the Greek word, and it leads us to the root word, which means Nike, which is victory. We showed how this details bringing us to 1 John. And 1 John is when the Son of Man comes. And there are those disciples who are then chosen after the apostles when he comes for 40 days. They're the Luke 24 group that will be his seals workers who will put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. And these are the ones that are with him, and they're all excited now, right? In 1 John, it says, we were with him, we touched him. You know, he revealed to us, and now nobody needs to teach them anything, it says, because they will already understand all these things, okay? So we, we talked on this and how this word conquering with the word overcome, see, to overcome, to prevail. This is the good kind. 
this is the overcomer over every every uh, uh, of the seven churches has overcomer, overcome, overcome. And that's because I believe the bride of Christ is the overcomers from all of the churches. But that includes also Smyrna and and um, and uh, uh, Philadelphia, which are more the 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 Israel or, or Jewish portion of people. So how can that be? Well, because remember, they were blinded in part. So there are going to be some from those tribes as well, from those churches that will also be in the escape. You see, because they were blinded in part. The rest of them are that Judah and the trumpets and and the end and everything else. This group that wasn't blinded were meant to be a part of the escape as well. (coughs) And that's why the seven churches have overcomers in all of them. And then all those that have to remain in their portion of time in the end of days, they will become the overcomers in that is to come portion of time. Make sense? Well, now here's the thing. We've broken this down and we've understood it, but there was still something, and a brother made a a really good comment about a specific name. And where this name is found is also important. Because you see, isn't this strange? Here we go again. Conquering, comma, and to conquer. Why? Why is the exact same word defined to us twice? What's the point? What you're about to see is another revelation that proves that this is the 40 days of the Son of Man that is directly related to Luke chapter 21 and the 40 days, that 40 plus days portion of time that comes before the 14 years. I'm going to prove it to you. See this conquering and to conquer? How many times have we said that there's this comma and shows that there is a separation That there are two things, but they're together. They're added together, but it's one plus one equals two. So they're both ones, but they're separate ones. And together they equal two. Or it could be one and two, which equals three. You see, they're they're separate things. But they're in this case, they're the same. One is conquering and one is conquer, but they're the same word. So what is the purpose? Well, it's, it's, it's exactly what we showed in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, comma, and, so it's a separation, a thousand years is as one day. And this is what we talked about earlier. It's those days in that second group portion that to us in time would be as thousands. And then you've got the time that we're in from Adam and we're in the thousands, but to the Lord, they're as a day. So what's the difference? Is it telling us the exact same thing? No. It's It sounds like it's the exact same thing. It's just switched it up. It's, it's like it just reversed it. But by giving us a comma and, it's showing us it's a separate thing, but they can be added together. So this would be what? Seven days and seven days? Or it would be 7,000 and 7,000, just like we taught. This same thing applies to Daniel. We've taught it many times, right? This same thing applies to um, uh, uh, what we shared in, in Daniel chapter 12. Time, times, and a half, which would be one, two, and a half. Or Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, time, and times, and a half time, is one plus two plus a half, which is three and a half years. So they're separate, but they are added together. That's the exact same thing with this. And it's no different than what we're showing here in Revelation chapter six. Now here's the mystery to this. Conquering, comma, and to conquer. So it's two separate things going on at the same time. Well, what is this? What on earth can it be? Well, if one relates to the overcoming, prevailing victory of the Lord, okay, which as the bow shows him here during the time of travail, 
which is the 40 days of the Son of Man before the 14 tribula of tribulation begins, then what would the other conquering refer to? Well, if the first one relates to Ephesus and the time of the espousals, which is the beginning time frame of the 50 days, that, that 50 to the beginning of the 40 days, right? That Ephesus to Smyrna, the new apostles being chosen to the, the seals workers chosen at the, at the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. Then what if we go look at the church of Ephesus? Look at what we see at, whoops, look at what we see at the church of Ephesus which relates to the beginning of the 50 days, right? When the Lord is going to choose those those disciple, uh, those apostles and then return on the eighth day for the other group. Listen to what it says. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Where am I? Okay, we've talked about this being the apostle portion before, but listen who's here. But this thou hast that thou hatest, uh, that thou hatest, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. What on earth is he doing here? Now, the Nicolaitans, if you do a study, it's kind of a, a debate. Is, it, is Nicolaitans, it, it relates to Nicholas, uh, which we see in Acts chapter 6, right? He was, um, he was a, what they call him, a proselyte. So he, he switched ways, right? It's like being a Democrat and going to Republican, okay? To be a proselyte. But is it also a connection to Nicodemus? Well, look at what happens. Look at this word for Nicolaitans. It's only used two times. So it's used here in Ephesus, which is at the beginning of everything. And it's also used a little bit later in Pergamum. Okay. Uh, uh, where is it? In Pergamum. Okay, about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, but we're looking at this beginning time, right? We're trying to understand more of this word for conquering and to conquer. Why would it be used twice? If one relates to Christ and, and him getting the victory over that Smyrna group and, and, and bringing them to, to the understanding and the revelation so that nobody teaches needs to teach them, what is the other conquering about? What is this other prevailing over people all about? Well, it just so happens we've got Nicolaitans mentioned here. And it comes from the word victorious over the people, which comes from the word to a conquest or victory, which of course then goes to the root, root, root word, which is that word victory that we talked about with overcomer. But this root, root word, goes to the victory of those on Christ's side. This one is a conquest over the people. It's a victory. It's a triumph. See, it's victorious over the people. Well, guess what? We know that in the end of days, in the typology, when we go through the Gospels, that we're at the end of this seventh year. We're coming to this tail end, right? Before that escape portion comes. And who do you find in chapter 7 of John, at the end of all places of the Gospel of John, in chapter 7, you have Nicodemus. Nicodemus say unto them, uh, um, But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night being one of them, Doth our law judge any man? before it hear him. What is he saying? Here's Nicodemus, which also is this victorious, see a victorious binding the people, binding the people together. And this victorious, check this out, comes from the word, just like Nicodemus, conquest. So you have this Nicolaitans, this Nicodemus typology, at the end, as the as the end and the, the bride is about to escape, and you've got this one character who's now involved at the time when the Son of Man is coming, and he is telling them 
as one who is getting victory as an overcomer, who is Christ, you have one who is getting victory over the people in conquest over them. And listen to what he says. Does not our law, or sorry, does our law judge any man before it hear him? So it's saying, hey, we can't judge anybody before what? Before we hear what he has to say. Before he's brought before the magistrates and we hear what he has to say, then we can judge him. But we can't judge him before that. Well, check this out. Watch this. Okay, there's Nicolaitans. So another definition is destruction of people. So you have the Nick, the Nick, the the Nicolaitans as a destruction of people. Okay, you have them as a as the as the typology Nicodemus because the name comes from the same roots. Many all the same roots except from the very beginning. The root words are all the same, being victorious over a group of people. Nicodemus says, "Hey, we can't judge these people unless they're brought." Before magistrates first. And it's to bring what? It's to bring a destruction against these people. How can we prove this? Watch this. Let's go to the word overcome. Okay? Watch this. This is so awesome. I had never looked at this in Blue Letter Bible before. Watch this. So conquering and to conquer. One we know is Christ prevailing in victory. It's used 28 times. So what if we go look? At the greater definition of this word, 58, G, sorry, G3528, and look at what it says, okay? We know it's used 28 times. 24 is overcome, conquer, prevail, get victory. Listen to this. To conquer, to carry off the victory of Christ, victorious over his foes. Why? That's right, because he's coming. It's the escape of the bride of Christ. And then he's going to get victory with that group of seals workers. But listen to what it says next. Of Christians that hold fast their faith even unto death against the power of their foes and temptations of per- and persecutions. When one is arraigned or goes to law to win the case, maintain one's cause. I don't think any of us have seen that before, have we? Or if we have read it, we just kind of read through it and never understood it before. Why does this matter? And how is this connected to the to the Nicolaitans at the beginning, to this Nicodemus character at the beginning? Well, they're prevailing over what? They're trying to get victory over what? This Christian group that Christ got victory over. Remember, when he comes for 40 days, the bride, he's already got victory over. She's gone. And now he's here for 40 days. And when he's here for 40 days, it's the the first John, right? It's the first John group. This group that is going to be the seals workers that that are given the understanding, the knowledge that, that he revealed the books to. And what happens to them? You have Nicodemus telling them, That they must be brought. We can't persecute these people because our law says we must must give them a chance to speak. And listen to what it says. Of Christians that hold fast their faith even unto death against the power power of their foes and temptation of persecutions. If this isn't the 40 days, then I don't know what is. Do you want to know why? Let's go to Luke chapter 21. And lock this down once and for all that undoubtedly the white horse rider is 100% the son of man when he comes for 40 days. Listen to this. What happens, as I read earlier, to the Luke group? Okay? Not the bride of Christ. There's the bride of Christ who is gone. And there is the disciple worker group that Christ is also going to get victory over who he's going to teach. And they're going to follow him and do these things with him for 40 days. Okay, they're the they're the Mark, they're the sorry, they're the Luke 24 group into the beginning of Acts. This is this group here. Listen to what it says. But before all these. Well, but before all what? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So before the white horse rider, these things are going to take place. And what is it? 
but before all these, they shall lay their hands, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and unto and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gain shall shall not be able to gainsay nor resist, and ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall perish. This is what? Before the nation against nation, which means before the red horse rider, which is during the time of the red white horse rider, you're going to be brought before magistrates by Nicolaitans or by the Nicodemuses, brought before rulers, and in the conquering and to conquer, one is the prevailing in victory that Christ is getting through these guys, and the other being a separate conquering are the ones that the Nicolaitans, that the Nicodemus type are bringing before rulers to be judged and what some of them being caused to be put to death. And what was the net definition to carry off victoriously and for Christians who will be persecuted uh, and will stand up in the, uh, what does it say? To hold fast their faith unto death against the power of their foes and temptations and persecutions. See, even unto death. And who is this group that is the sum of you that is going to be in this persecution even unto death? You know it. It's our brothers and sisters that follow the Lord that he chose at the beginning of his 40 days. And what's going to happen? Who are they? They are Smyrna. They are Smyrna. See, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. Brothers and sisters, we have now nailed down. It, it's a done deal. We have covered every key piece of word of the white horse rider, from his bow to his crown, to it being given to him, to his conquering and victory that he gets, to the conquering that comes from the Nicolaitans, which is the persecution that will take place during the 40 days of the Son of Man against those who are with him, just as we've been teaching from Luke's, sorry, from, from Luke's discourse, which is all about the beginning of, before the 14 years and the first destruction that takes place with Jerusalem. Because remember, and when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, know that the destruction thereof is nigh. The destruction doesn't happen right away. It will happen at the end of the 40 days because during the 40 days is this persecution of those proclaiming the, the salvation, the time to turn to Christ. Remember, tens of millions of people will have vanished. Brothers and sisters, man, I pray this video has blessed you. I know it, it, it. I covered a bunch. It's worth watching again. I will give you guys plenty of time to watch it. But we are living in an exciting time. We see the pressures taking place now in the world, getting much more intense in many places of the world. Food supplies, right? The, the mandates coming in. All of this, all of this commotion going on around the world. Guys, remember where we are. We are probably right here, right now, in Luke 21, verse 9. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end is not by and by. Brothers and sisters, we are knocking on the door. His hand is on the doorknob. He is beginning to turn it. 
and we will be here with you until that time comes. We will continue to endure and to push. We are right here right now on January 31st with one, two, three, four and a half months to go. But be strong, be encouraged, come and join us over at Ministry Revealed in the forum, and we will continue to lift each other up and strengthen each other until, oh man, this was a long one today. <laughs> I pray that it blesses you guys. It was jam-packed with awesome stuff. So God bless you. God bless your families. I love you. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.